coming on, Justin. Thanks for having me. In Florida, where you where you where you live now? I live in Ohio right now. Okay. So uh, basically, I want to just introduce your story real quick, and then you can uh, you can elaborate. But basically, you did you were sentenced to twelve years in prison for trafficking bath salts from China, right? You can call it bath salts. So, you know, we had a variety of chemicals, everything from JWH-18 to uh, methylone. Uh, that's really what got us on the Fed's radar. A little bit closer. What really got us on the DEA's radar was uh, methylone, which is synthetic MDMA. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people, partygoers take it, and it makes them feel good. A lot of people call it bath salts. Um, is, that what the, is that what the news calls bath salts? Is it the same thing? Uh, yeah, it can be a variety of chemicals. A lot of people would blend. Like that guy in Miami that like was eating people's faces off. Yeah. That was like, what, 10 years ago? Was that the same but shit that you were selling? It was like five different chemicals blended in one, you know. Okay. So uh, experimental, they call them research chemicals, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> research chemicals. But, uh, but yeah. And you actually, uh, you met Matt Cox in prison, too? You were in the same prison as Matt Cox? So in prison, I didn't meet him, but I, I, when I met him in person... And we realized we were at the same facility. I re- I recalled looking out the door and B unit and seeing him beelining it for the library. So he's always like in the front of the pack, just going as fast as he possibly can because the library only holds like a hundred people. Just a little man running. <laughs> you can't miss it. <laughs> Very memorable. <laughs> That's hilarious. But you never actually talked to him when you were in there. In prison, I never talked to the guy. Wow. Never. We have some mutual friends. Uh, Donovan Davis. Yeah, um, yeah. He wrote his story. Yeah. Um, who else? Uh, he knows uh, F- Frank Venice, big real estate guy here in Florida, uh, mm-hmm. commercial real estate guy. He got like 15 years for running some kind of like retail uh, wholesale scheme. Mm. Um, of course, I believe the guy's innocent, just like yeah. Donovan, actually. Pretty wild. Yeah. But uh, yeah, never um, met him in prison. What about, did you ever meet Frank Amadeo? I, de- I didn't meet Frank Amadeo, but uh. very <clears throat> popular. Uh, his name floated around the compound. Yeah. Very known guy. Yeah, I was sure. talking to him a little bit before he got out. I've been trying to keep in touch with him, but okay. So, um, for the sake of the story, can you sort of like s- explain how this whole thing began with you distributing this shit and and eventually getting busted? Sure. So, you know, I moved to Orlando in 2004 to go to college. Um, after college, I started working at a real estate company. Uh, we were doing really well, and then I saw an opportunity. Uh, I was actually playing poker one day, and this guy slid a little packet across the table. He said, what is this? If you can figure out what this is, we can make a lot of money. And What do you so, mean he was, like, trying it and couldn't figure no, it out? No, he actually owned head shops. And oh, okay. so he, they sold these products in their stores, and he didn't understand. He didn't really know what they were putting on the Damniana and, and Marshmallow, the loose leaf, that was making people high. It was giving, At the time, JWH-18, gave, it literally was like a weed high. So it wasn't crazy. Now when you hear uh, K2, like, <laughs> run for the hills because that stuff is making people flop on the floor. Dangerous stuff. And I've seen it with my own eyes. Not cool. Um, but back, back then, before they kept modifying... You know, what they do is they move it like one carbon molecule to the left or whatever, and then they just call it something else, and now they've got all kinds of chemicals. I don't even know what they're currently selling, the, the cannabinoids, but they don't produce a cannabis like high. Now they're like more like a tryptamine or something. Like It's, like, it's literally like they went into another universe. So yeah. not cannabis. <laughs> um, so that's what you were trying to basically do is just mimic cannabis. Because yeah, can, it obviously wasn't legal back then. Right. So... You know, they had a line. That was their that was their bread and butter at the head shops when it was legal, when they could buy this stuff. Um, mm. it, it was never scheduled. See, it wasn't scheduled at the time. Uh, it was covered under the Federal Analog Act, though. In the Federal Analog Act, see, what you, you, in the feds, you have the Controlled Substances Act, which, con- which controls everything, Category 1 through 4 or whatever, of all of the listed controlled substances. But then they've also got what's called the Federal Analog Act. The Federal Analog Act states that any substance that produces a similar or like mind-altering effect, they can charge you with the nearest related substance. So even though that's not the substance you have, Mm -hmm. that's what they're going to charge you with because it produces a similar effect. And probably rightfully so. I mean, uh, some of these experimental drugs people are misusing, and they're extremely dangerous. But uh, where they could just go get the real thing and, and know their proper dosage and, you know, if they like using drugs for recreational purposes... I believe that's on them. Like me personally, my beliefs are the government shouldn't really have a whole lot to say with what we can buy, sell, consume, or possess. If you like to get high, get high. Um, 
So, you know, and I justify that. My libertarian viewpoints, and uh, I justify what I was doing. I disconnected. I disassociated with me enabling people and potentially putting people in, in harm's way. Um, I think being in prison, I, I kind of connected those dots a little better. Like I realized like, Hey, I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. And, and money isn't what money isn't what you can't buy happiness. You know, you I think a study shows that like up to like 80 grand a year or something, your happiness can increase as you make more money. But after that, the law of diminishing returns kicks in and, and you just, it, it doesn't help. If anything, it co- further complicates things and it makes your life crazy. So what brings happiness to me, what brings joy to me in my life, I've realized is helping people. If I can create something that helps people and adds value to people's lives, then I feel better about myself. It isn't about how much money is in my wallet or my mm-hmm. bank account. It's about how I'm, what I'm contributing, what I'm helping, how I'm helping. Right. I mean, now you say that after prison. <laughs> I mean, but what, so, yeah. so, um, when you when you were playing <laughs> poker and your buddy slid this little baggie of, of yeah. K2 it, to yep. you, mm-hmm. what happened after that? This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Blue Chew. It's good for her and it's even better for you. Blue Chew is a cheat code for your dick because no one likes a little limp noodle dick. Right now, our listeners can get Blue Chew for free with the promo code CONCRETE at checkout and just pay $5 shipping. Blue Chew is a unique online service that offers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but it's chewable and it's a fraction of the cost. Blue Chew tablets help men achieve harder, stronger erections to combat all forms of erectile dysfunction. Blue Chew is an online prescription service, so no doctor's visits, no doctor's offices, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy, and it ships right to your front door in a discreet package. The process is simple. Just sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And the best part is, it's all done online. Don't like swallowing pills? No problems here, bud. Blue Chew's tablets are chewable. Blue Chew's tablets are also made in the USA, so they prepare and ship direct, and it's cheaper than a pharmacy. Get your dick harder than Chinese arithmetic. Try Blue Chew for free by using the code CONCRETE at checkout and just pay $5 shipping. That's B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W.com, promo code CONCRETE, K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E, to receive your first month free. So I sent it to a lab in Texas. I had it analyzed, and it came back as JWH. And JWH is a, it's an analog. It's a, can, it's a synthetic cannabinoid. Mm-hmm. At the time, it was not scheduled. Um, and then I started looking for suppliers. And in China, I found a whole, a whole host of suppliers. I ended up going with a company called uh, Kanzotech. Excuse me. Kanzotech Private Limited in J- Jiangsu, China. And I was getting this stuff for like 1200 bucks a kilogram. Wait, wait, how, wait, how do you go, how do you, I feel like you, you're progressing down this path way too fast. Like, what were you doing prior to this? How are you making money? What were you doing? I was running a property management company. Okay. So I was making a buck 20 a year. I was doing good. Uh, you know, I have a college degree. I was doing good. But at the, at the time, like, I see a way to make money and the entrepreneur in me is just like, figure out how to do it. I wasn't thinking about the repercussions. I wasn't thinking about who it might hurt. I wasn't thinking about... The consequences, positive or negative. I was just thinking about so how you, much money can we make and how fast. You knew that you could sell this stuff to head shops. Right. And people so, that were producing the products, selling it to head shops. Like I have a buddy in the Fort Lauderdale area, won't say any names, but was, you know, selling millions of units. So you knew somebody who was already doing it. And you, a wanted, very large you wanted to duplicate what he was doing. I didn't just want to duplicate it. I wanted to get myself in the middle between me and the people that were producing it. And I wanted to become the largest importer, period. I wanted to find a way to position myself where we were bringing the largest amount possible into the country and reselling it to people who were producing the products. And I was pretty successful at doing that. I negotiated a consignment relationship. We were bringing in hundreds of kilos a month. So um, a very large quantity of, of, of this stuff. So, okay. So, so, um, once you, how did you find somebody in China with, and how did you know what you were looking for? Google. You just Google. <laughs> you just Google the ingredients so, of this stuff, and then you found out the biggest manufacturer. Of right. The, so I searched the chemical. When I found out what the chemical was, yeah. then I searched it, 
And I started looking for suppliers, and I saw, like, I think Reddit. I just read and read and read, and I found some people that said, hey, you can order from this lab, you can order from this lab. And mm-hmm. and I just went out. I think the very first the very first time I placed an order, uh, I just sent a Western Union. And, you know, that got more sophisticated. When you're sending hundreds of thousands of dollars to China, you can't just keep sending money through Western Union and MoneyGram. So we started using Bitcoin. We started trying to discuss. We started using PGP, pretty good privacy, uh, PGP encryption. Mm-hmm. So between all of the communication between me and the suppliers in China was encrypted. But the problem is, and the, the, all of your emails are archived. Everything in Gmail is archived. It goes all the way back. The NSA has a copy of it. I promise you they do. Any of the federal agencies, the alphabet soup agencies can access it. The DHS, the DEA, the FBI. Once they get a Title III, once they conjure a grand jury and they bring an indictment against you, all of that is like public information to them. They can see it all. So uh, even if you go through and delete a message on Facebook or something, it's not deleted. Trust me, it's not deleted. It's archived in NSA servers. Um, So what happened As well as text messages too, probably. Everything. I think it's called PRISM. So you have to look it up, but- the, the federal government, uh, the Pentagon and the DHS, and they, they kind of they connect it all together through this back office system. It's called PRISM. Mm-hmm. And what it is, it's like we're each a node in like a, a mesh topology. So we're all connected, just like every computer, every device on the Internet is all connected. Mm-hmm. We're all connected in this system in PRISM. So they can pull me up, Justin Smith. Now it pulls it up on the map. And now that you and I have set at this table together, now there's a line drawn from me to you. So they know that we're sitting in the same room together. Wow. You know, it's, it's, I don't know how sophisticated the AI is, but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's the best technology on earth. Right. But, um, so you, you were, uh, cognizant of this and you went the extra step to make sure all your communication with this company in China was super encrypted. As, as good as we could. But the problem is, is those emails, those first few emails, I think it was three emails before we started encrypting Mm. was enough to bring an indictment against me. Fuck. Those three emails, when they slid them across the table, I had every intention on taking it to trial. But when they slid those emails across the table and it said, do you have these substances and how much are they? They responded with the price list. And then I said, this is the one we want. And, That's all they needed. And then they had an email with the Western Union confirmation. Proof that I ordered it. So if I went before a jury with that proof, they didn't need anybody to testify against me. They didn't need anything else. They had everything they needed in the first few emails. So what good is encrypting everything else if the first three, each, you know right, what I mean, gave right. it away? So, um, Fuck, man. yeah, man. Hindsight's twenty twenty, but honestly, I don't regret <clears throat> going down the path that I went down. I, mm-hmm. It's tough now. Like it is like getting out, you know, obviously I have, we have, I have my own company and we're doing good, but the first year or so reintegrating into society after you're incarcerated is difficult. You know, you have to play by the rules. You're not technically allowed to own your own business or at least make money from it. There's all kinds of, of of rules. Um, after you found the company in China that you want to do business with, how much were you buying with them? What kind of deal did you do with them? So it started slow. I ordered a key. I think I ordered a kilogram probably, or maybe 500 grams. How much was that? Uh, a thousand bucks. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, it wasn't much. The kilo, the the I think the kilogram we were paying fifteen hundred for, but when I bought a hundred of them, I would get twelve hundred dollars. Okay, I think the cheapest we ever got it was like eleven hundred. Okay, so you know, and the chemicals quickly change. So China isn't like the United States. In the United States, like we find out like something's going to be scheduled, or something's you know undergoing testing right now. They're determining whether or not they're going to bring it on the schedule, how it's going to be scheduled, what the potency is. The DEA toxicology report comes back and says it's like equivalent to this amount of marijuana or whatever. It's pretty crazy how they do that, actually. But um, in China, it's black and white. It's like it's either illegal or it's not. There's no gray area. And they give their manufacturers a heads up. They're like, look, whatever you got of this chemical, liquidate it, get rid of it or destroy it. Because after this date, which is I think it's usually like January 1st, (laughs) um, if you get caught with it, you're going to prison. So, um, you know, their, their suppliers in China know that and they work around it. So when, it, when something's coming up, they know it's going to be scheduled. They just change the chemical a little bit where it s- still produces a similar effect, mm. but now it's technically legally a different chemical. So, or chemically a different yeah. <laughs> chemical. So, uh, so that's how they s- skirt the law there. And it, I, you know, is it really skirting the law? I don't know. I think th- they, they just haven't thought it through as much as we have. In the United mm. States, 
if it produces a similar like mind altering effect, it doesn't matter if it's illegal or not. If you get caught with that substance, you're going to prison. Okay. So very different. So what was the first substance that you were buying? JWH18. JWH18. And yep. you were buying this for like 1100 bucks a kilo. Yep. 15, 15. And, and, and then you, it got cheaper. And then yeah. what? You started selling it to who? Started selling it to people who were producing, producing the products. Okay. And started producing our own brand called Kush. We actually had the first menthol variety called Kush Ice. And we were selling thousands, tens of thousands of units. So we sold them little plastic vials all over Florida. And uh, they got, it's crazy how much, how we sold them for a dollar a piece on consignment. And one gram of pure JWH-18 would produce 10 grams of smokable product. So uh, pretty how crazy. How much came in a little vial? One gram. One gram. One gram. And a dollar see, a piece. Well, we sold it for a dollar a piece. The stores are selling it for... Mm -hmm. 20 bucks, $25. Yeah. So they're making a crazy, markup. crazy. Well, see, K, that's how we got in by lowballing people. Mm. K2 is charging five, $6 a unit. Mm -hmm. And we're selling it for a dollar on okay. consignment. So okay. we're getting a check net 30. We're not getting paid the day they get it. We're getting right. paid 30 days from then. So how long did it take before you started making like crazy money? Uh, about a year, six months to a year, six months. We were making three to 5,000 a month. It wasn't crazy. After a year, we were making like, man, we had $20,000 days. It was, I remember one day we did almost a hundred grand. And I, I remember thinking like, wow, like we made it. This is the biggest payday I've ever had. And the amount of money that was coming in, it was impossible to say no. And I knew that we were playing with fire at that point. I already knew I, it was like a feeling, man, your intuition will never lie to you. And it, the problem is all these temptations, you know what I mean? The lifestyle, being able to fly to Vegas and rent helicopters and do whatever and not think about the price tag. That is so alluring that when you're caught in the mix, or at least I can use I statements, when I was caught in the mix, I couldn't say no, you know? And now, having been through what I've been through, it's a totally different story. Of course I would say no, but... Um, so when you say a hundred thousand dollar days, is that like like revenue or is that profit? Revenue. Revenue. Yeah. Yeah, but that's it, insane. That's a crazy yeah, amount of money, man. Yeah, we're paying what? And how old were you? Uh twenty five, twenty six. Wow. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Yeah, so so you were making a shitload of money and you started getting worried like this can go south very quickly. I remember one day <laughs> one day of all places, I was sitting on a toilet and I had this overwhelming sense that just came over me and I was like I just felt flushed. Like I, I realized, like I was like, if I don't stop doing this, there's going to be a problem. You know, I, I, I just, I, I, I don't know. Like I'm not clairvoyant or anything. I just, I just, but I just knew that like I was, I was operating in gray area. We got multiple letters from the FDA. So the FDA sent us letters saying, stop selling this product oh. or we can bring criminal action against you. And I would rip them up and throw them in the trash. You know, I went and talked to a lawyer and I was like, can they really do this? And this lawyer was not a federal lawyer. But he's like, no, as long as it's not scheduled, you're good. If it's not like an illegal banned substance, all I can do is threaten you. And it wasn't an illegal banned substance. It wasn't at the time, no. It wasn't. But, the, you know, they would tell us, like, it's going to be scheduled. People are misusing this. Their letter would say, like, people are consuming this as a, as a drug. It, it produces uh, undesirable effects. It's dangerous. Stop selling it. So the FDA will send you warnings. They'll tell you stop selling the product. The DEA doesn't send warnings. <laughs> the DEA kicks in your door. Uh, but they sent letters, though. The Those the were, F kind, those were kind of like warnings. The FDA, yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, they all work together. Yeah. You know, the Food and Drug Administration, the D the DEA, they they all work together. Did you hear any stories back then, like when you were selling it, of people like, like doing fucked up shit, like eating people's faces off? I mean, like the, the one in the news, but me personally, I never experienced anything like that. You know, I think... That's probably a mixture. Did you try it? Yeah. Did you? Yeah, I tried it. What was it like? Like weed. Just like smoking weed? It was like smoking weed. Wow. I mean, back in the JWH 18 days, I remember, I won't say, I can't say who it is, but but uh, they came to visit me from, from Philadelphia, mm. and I got some of this in, and I'd never tried it, and I was like, you know, people say it's good. Let's, let's try it. And we packed a bowl, and we smoked it, and we just, we watched a movie that they had produced. They produced a movie, um... And we all got high before we watched the movie, and it was like a weed high, and it was really? it was actually enjoyable. But those chemicals, trust me, do not use spice, K2, whatever. Today, it's not the same thing. 
So I don't know what the – I'm sure they've changed a thousand times since then, but they're in prison, it's like – an epidemic. Screw coronavirus. Like the K2 problem in prison is insane. Every day someone is falling out. They're swimming on the concrete. They're screaming Jesus. Um, they're, they're, it, they see, it's making them see things. It's like an LSD trip. Why is it so different now? Because they keep changing the chemical and it, it's all experimental. Like they, these drugs have never existed. So you know, they just keep changing it, and they don't know how it's going to interact with your cannabinoid receptors. Excuse me, if that's even what it's interacting with at this point, I, I'm convinced that it's not even a cannabinoid. Like, seeing seeing the way people react to this stuff, yeah, nah. But you never saw anybody react like that when you were made, when you were selling it? No, definitely not. Never? No, you know, that's, and that goes back to, like, my libertarian viewpoints. I see prohibition as the problem. Like, if, if you make weed illegal... Yeah. All right. And then to the point where people feel like they have to produce a chemical to circumvent drug testing. Mm -hmm. They can't just smoke a plant, which grows from the ground. You know, that's why this stuff all came about. Yeah. It would have never existed if, if prohibition wasn't here. If, 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 if weed was legal, you would not have been in business. That's true, too. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. Wild. So uh, how long did this last when you were making $20,000 a day? About a year. We, so what, what happened was there was another product on the shelves, and it, it came in a little pack of two little red pills. It looked like the Walmart smiley face and happy time pills. Some, people, some of them just had happy times. Mr. Happy, um, Mr. Nice Guy, is that the same stuff? Uh, well, Mr. Nice Guy, K2, um, happy, methalone, knockoff Molly. Okay. So that's when the DEA, the DEA didn't ever do anything. As far as I know, their investigation didn't even involve the JWH-18. FDA didn't like the synthetic cannabinoids. DEA drew the line in the sand at Molly. So when they see, you know, people are taking this club drug, people overdose on this stuff, this is dangerous, the DEA gets involved. And that's when, that's when uh, we, we experience the problems. So, you know, we got indicted on BK MDMA, methalone. That is what the DEA indicted us on. That is like synthetic molly or like you said, bath salts. You know, yeah. people call it whatever. So um, up, up until the point you got indicted, like what, what was the process like to where you first realized like, shit, we might be in some shit to the point where you finally got indicted? Like what was it? Was it, was it instantaneous? Did it, it happen like the next day? It was instantaneous, but, you know, I did have my intuition. Like, I remember I got an email from the supplier that asked for a phone number, wanted to talk. And I was like, wait a minute, did, did somehow, did the federal government, and f like, somehow crack their PGP? And, like, this just seems fishy. But it was such a big order. It was, like, 300 kilos. So it was such a big order that even though it seemed fishy, I took the bait. So definitely was baited. I, at, at the time, I wanted to think, I was sitting in county jail, and I'm thinking, like, was I honey potted? Like, did somehow the federal government set up a honey pot in China? And like, it just seemed weird how, you know, how it all came about. Did you, did you get some some prostitutes in China? No, no. Isn't that what a honey pot is when they try to get some <laughs> hot chick to? Like, well, what I meant by that is like they set up like a sting operation or a honey pot where they would like they facilitate the drug trade. And uh -huh. so the government actually sets up an offshore entity, facilitates the drug trade, lets you oh. <laughs> get big so that they can knock your head off once you get to the point where you're on their radar. Oh, okay. I thought, so, I thought a honey, that, maybe I'm thinking of a honey trap. Maybe there's a difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> so did you actually go to China to check out this company? No, no, no you never went there. Nope. Wow. Nope. Hmm. So, uh, it wasn't necessary. So what, what, what was it like the day that you found out you were fucked? Oh, uh, size 12 military boot on the side of your head, fully automatic weapons in your face. How did that um, walk me through that day? Uh, they laying in bed, they kicked the door in, um, like early in the morning, late at night, midday was like, right. It was like 10 o'clock, mm -hmm. 10 o'clock in the morning. And you're in Orlando in Orlando. They kicked the door in, um, people all over the lawn. I mean, all up the street they had, I mean, it was just crazy. People with video cameras. Um, th there's no warning. They don't knock. Mm -hmm. You know, they just kick the door in. They come in with guns from all angles. What? They throw you on the ground. They bust all your doors. They rip doors off the hinges. They destroy the place. 
and they hold you to the ground with a, you know, a huge military boot until they zip tie your hands and then throw you in the back of a dog catcher and take you in for questioning. Fuck. They, they beat you up a little bit when they did that? No, I mean, no. No, it, that's good. Well, besides the guy's boot on your I head. I mean, they're not, they're not gentle. No. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the way they see it, and the way, if you read that article at the Department of Justice, they paint me like I'm some El Chapo. Mm. Then, you know, what's funny is the, the girl I'm dating right now, she has a lot of law enforcement in her family. Mm-hmm. And her family is adamant on her not dating me. Really? They think I'm some big, dangerous drug trafficker. Um, one of her brother-in-laws said, if you choose this lifestyle, like, what does that mean? If you choose this lifestyle... We're disowning you. You're not allowed to see your niece and nephew anymore. You're not welcome at our house. And she says, but he's not trafficking drugs. He has an, he has an app. It's a, it's a C corporation in Delaware. He has employees. He has revenue. It's all done legally. And he said, well, you know, if he was doing like hard physical labor, like I just don't believe it. He thinks that Contractor Plus is some way for me to launder drug money or mm-hmm. wash drug money. I would never touch drugs again. I don't yeah. care to use them. I don't care to sell them. But convincing someone who is in that line of work of that is, is difficult, you know? Yeah. Uh, Matt talks a lot, a lot about his, his troubles trying to, uh, make friends and meet new people and people judge him for his past. Dude, it's hard. Have you ever seen orange is the new black? Yeah. I, see, I, so I saw like the first two seasons. The last season is actually really important because it shows Piper's reintegration into society. Mm. It shows her interaction with her probation officer. It shows the struggle she has finding employment, maintaining employment, Dude, I never thought it would be a problem. As soon as I got, I had an internship in college at 111 Records. As soon as I completed, um, as soon as I got my degree, I applied for one job. Yeah. And I got that job as a web designer, a web developer, which is not what I went to school for. Yeah. But so I got that job. Within six months, I'm running that business and another business owned by that guy. Another six months later, I'm given equity. I'm promoted to vice president. I'm running the whole business. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you know, and I ran that business for almost seven years. Yeah. So finding a, finding employment has never been a struggle for me. I started my first business at 13. Uh, before I ever went to college, I started working as a e-commerce director. I think I was 18, 17 years old, 18 years old in Pittsburgh at, um, at, at, um, uh, action fanatics. And so, and then, so they're like a paintball distributor. Uh, Jeff Lizick owned that company. Brilliant man, by the way. Who's he owns, Jeff Lizick? Uh, he owns a marketing company now in Pittsburgh, and he's been <clears> buying up smaller marketing companies. Uh, he, he's been kind of like a mentor to me. Uh, he believed in me when I was 17 years old. Mm. I remember I got a call from him, and he, I was working. I was stocking shelves at Office Max, and he said, do you know who I am? And I said, no. And he said, well, where are you at right now? And I told him, and he laughed, and he was like, dude, he was like, I saw the website you built for the paintball team in uh, Columbus and he said the, the it was an indoor paintball field he said I saw the website that you built and it was just immaculate it was awesome dude mm-hmm. and I need you to come to Pittsburgh how quick can you come to Pittsburgh and I think he gave me like 25 bucks an hour you know that's that's pretty good pay for a 17 year old kid hell yeah so I went to Pittsburgh I built their new website we migrated to an e-commerce platform called Enfopia a couple months later that company, our, our main supplier, Key Action Sports in Sewell, New Jersey, owned by a guy named Gino Posterivo, one of the biggest, the biggest brand in the sport of paintball. They offered, they called Jeff and said, who built your new website? And so they called Jeff and they told him to come to Sewell, New Jersey, and to brain me. So I go to Pittsburgh, get in a car with Jeff, and we drive across the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, they pulled us in the conference room separately first together and then separately and they, they made job offers and because of my age they offered me i think 35 grand a year and i told them no uh i said you know my age has nothing to do with it mm-hmm. i'm making more money than that right now right so but you're gonna have 10 people working for you you know this, this is just a starting pay they tried to sell me on the opportunity and i said well i haven't even went to college yet you know i want to go to college mm-hmm. and jeff uh they offered him like 185 a year um and like a 10-year contract he told him no as well so, um, you know, just pretty interesting. At that point, I said it was a pivotal moment. I said, you know what? I'm going to college. I want to go to full sale, going to college in Orlando. Mm-hmm. And I up and moved to Orlando. And uh, that's when life began. Pretty okay. crazy. What did you get your degree in? Music business. 
How, have you paid off your uh, no. your tuition yet? Absolutely not. It's f- so crazy, dude. I, ha- I I think I told you this already, but I've had probably like five or six people on here that went to Full sale. No one's paid off their tuition yet. Well, it's an expensive school. I think, you know, the, for the bachelor's degree, you can't work where you go to that school because they have a split schedule where you go from like 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then you, you have four, three or four hours off and then you come back for another four hours right. for your live labs. So it's impossible to maintain employment. Unless you're doing your own thing on the internet or something as a freelancer, you couldn't work and go to full sale. So you, a lot of people, unless you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you have to take out student loans and for your living expenses as well. And that's what I did. So I think I have $120,000 in student loans and I paid on that for years, but it's like a $1,200 payment was just paying the interest. So it, pretty wild. How I much mean, is the interest on that loan? I don't know. I don't know what it is. I think it was a 12%. How much, do you, owe, it was, it how much do you owe now? Uh, a hundred. Well, so while I was incarcerated, a lot of those loans were charged off and I've disputed and disputed and disputed. I've actually got them all deleted off the credit. So all mm. three credit bureaus, there's no student loans. Ooh, that's nice. COVID that's I think was a blessing because people were working remotely. I don't know if that's why they got deleted, but mm. I know that I was persistent. I disputed every month and eventually things just went away. And now my credit's trending towards 800. Hell yeah. Yeah, I actually started fixing my credit from federal prison. Did you really? I started making steps like setting up credit builder accounts. <clears throat> I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> so, you know, make trying to make the right steps. Like I set up a... What's a credit builder account? Like uh, self.com okay. uh, or self.inc, I think is what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, you set up a... It's like a loan. It's a, it's a CD. Every month you put 150 bucks into it. And then after a year, it unlocks. You get the money back. Or you can roll it over into a prepaid card. Mm. All of that payment activity goes to build your credit profile. So, you know, part of it was understanding what really contributed to building credit, what it meant, because, you know, negative items is one thing. Um, Having positive history is another. And both things are equally as important. So I read books on it and multiple books. And I and I learned what I needed to do to get my credit looking right. And it worked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's it's not hard. It's just it's just a matter of taking the time to do it. And it's the smartest thing you could do, because everything is dependent on your credit, whether you're going to, to buy a place and you want a low interest rate on a mortgage or, you know, you're going to buy a car, uh, that, that, that one point, you know, 1% in interest makes a big difference in your payment. Oh, hell yeah. So uh, having a good credit rating is important, mm-hmm. especially as a felon, because that's now as a felon, most HOAs in the country, I can't live in, mm-hmm. you know, they, they don't want me. I'm undesirable now. Um, there's countries I can't travel to, you know, Australia, it's a no-go zone. Mm. I think even Canada, I can't really. Go to. Yeah. So, you know, I'm marked for life in that regard. Can never own a firearm again. Um, there's a lot of things that I can't do. I can apply to like vote again. I don't vote. Don't care about voting. But, um, but it, pretty much once you go down that path and once you make that mistake, your prison sentence is just the start of it. Mm. It never really ends. Right when I got out, I had a great job interview more than qualified. It was a marketing director position in Columbus, Ohio, paid $160,000 a year. I was hands down the best person for the job. I went through the first interview. They loved me. Went through the second interview with the executives. They loved me. Got to the third interview. It was, it was, they already made a contingent job offer yeah. with HR. They were vetting me, running me through the background check. I said, I think at this time I should give you full disclosure. I just got out of federal prison. Mm-hmm. Whoa, wait a minute. Pump yeah. the brakes. We can't hire you. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. You like the person, you know that, you know, their portfolio speaks for themselves, that you know that they can do what you need done properly. You know that they meet your culture demands, like they're going to yeah. be a good fit for your company. And you find out that they went to prison for drug trafficking and get out of our office. Is that what your charge was? Drug trafficking? Yep. Drug, drug what, trafficking conspiracy. That was, what was the actual charge like verbatim? Like drug what? trafficking conspiracy. Okay. Cons- yeah, that, that's what they charge you with. Mm. Did they get you with like an amount or anything? Uh, yeah, hundred. They they just threw a number out there. A hundred kilograms. A hundred kilograms. So of, they see, what, do they, what do they call it? They uh, methalone BK, mm. BK hyphen MDMA. So they actually seized two hundred and or three hundred. I forget two hundred and eighty four kilos. I think mm-hmm. in the mail. So that's what they actually oh, seized in one wow. shipment. And it was all going to addresses that were linked to me. And so yeah, that was... Talk, make sure you're yeah. talking about it. Yeah. So 
so, th- you know, that's how the, they say the invest- investigation culminated mm-hmm. was through that seizure. Of course, it didn't. It started way before that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's the gist of it. So what happened after they knocked your, your door down, put the zip ties around your <laughs> your legs and your wrists and threw you in the back of the patio? Just wagon. your wrist. They just throw it just around the wrist. your wrist. Yeah, so they take you to a holding cell downtown. Mm-hmm. It's in the courthouse. They uh, they ask you questions. They they try to scare you. They you know they 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 talk a lot of crap. They say they got you dead to right. They try to convince you to tell them something. Mm-hmm. Of course, if you're smart, you'll keep your mouth shut. Um, what did you do? I kept my mouth shut. Uh, I I demanded to speak to my lawyer first. At the time, th- my lawyer wasn't a federal lawyer, so he'd never represented a federal client. So he, when I talked to him, he said, "Listen, man." This is way over my head. He said, I can refer you to somebody who can help you. And he referred me to Mark Najame, and this guy charged me $30,000 um, just as a consultancy. That's cheap. You know, when, if you actually go to trial, like Donovan Davis went to trial, I think he had two lawyers, and he ended up spending over a million dollars on his legal defense. So, and, so you still had access to your money? Well, yeah. So not all of my money. Uh, they was, didn't. They didn't seize your bank accounts or anything. No, they did. They so did. the Wells Fargo account, they they closed it down. I couldn't access it anymore. Um, they seized a lot of cash um, from the business and from from my personal property. They seized all of my assets, my computers, my electronics. Um, they took everything. So vehicles, they took it all. Um, so, but I, I, not all of my income was generated illegitimately. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm still making money legally. I have uh, clients. I had a client in Punta Gorda, a, a doctor. I was 60 grand a year. I had a client. Doing uh, what? Web development, okay. web development, video production, right. uh, different marketing services. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had another cl- client who was like a lifestyle coach. Um, so I had revenue coming in that was mm-hmm. legal. They couldn't touch that. And I also had Serpify. So, you know, at the time, making money legitimately, the feds can't touch your money that you're making legitimately they can only take what they can prove you're not supposed to have yeah by their you know so uh you're sitting in the cell they're trying to scare the shit out of you trying to get you to confess everything and you call your lawyer and uh what did he say like what what were you looking at so he said that i was looking at five years is he said look he said if you, he said, he said, before you say anything, before we do anything, I need to see the evidence they have against you. Mm-hmm. I need to know whether or not, he said, I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you to go to trial or not go to trial. That's going to be your decision. But I can tell you what I would do if I was in your shoes. I could tell you what I would do based on the evidence they have against me and the, the, the time that you're facing. Mm-hmm. When it all came down, he, he looked at everything and he said, well, you know, loosely scheduled substance is not, you know, it's not like crack cocaine or something with a stiff sentence. He said they're going to base it on the marijuana equivalency table. They do this ratio adjustment based on the based on the quantity. And, you know, they did that in our case, too. So I was sentenced to uh, t- t- 151 months. But then when the DEA toxicology report came back uh, that showed our substance was actually less than half as potent as what they initially thought it was, they had to t- they had to do a three or four level departure based on that equivalency, based on that rate, based on what their toxicology report showed it as. So that, of course, helped. So they were charging you based on, because it was the closest to weed, right? So they were saying you have this X amount of kilo, 100, what was it, 100? 100 kilos. 100 kilos. They were saying, okay, we're going to, since we don't really have a crime that fits this exact drug, we're just going to give you the whatever the crime would be for 100 kilos of weed. No. So initially they were saying that one gram of what we had was equivalent to 500 grams mm. of marijuana. Oh, got it. So okay. they, they do this. I don't know. I don't know how they get the ratio down, but they do this weird math. They convert everything to marijuana. Okay. And then they convert it into time based on marijuana. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how they're going to do that when weed is fully legal, which I presume under this administration, it should be happening soon. And you said they do that with all drugs. They do that with all kinds of shit. They just figure out they what, do it's with the, what it's the closest to. They, they always, do some sort of they math equation. to marijuana, and then they sentence you based on that conversion. <laughs> That's so fucking crazy. It doesn't make any sense. I don't. In 1984, I believe, the United uh, the, they abolished federal parole, 
So before that, you could parole out early on good behavior. Mm-hmm. That same time, that was during the Reagan administration, they instated the the um, United States Sentencing Commission. The United States Sentencing Commission replaced federal parole. And what they did was they had like, it's like a numbered system. So there's like a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, it's like one through 40 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then on the horizontal axis, it's based on your criminal history. Mm -hmm. So if you have priors, if you've been in trouble before, then every prior you have, just move yourself one row to the right. Got it. Um, And then based on the quantity that you have, or based on that conversion to marijuana, Mm. they decide where you belong on that vertical axis. And then wherever that positions you, they circle that number, that's how much time you're getting. And the judge has his hands tied. There's not a whole lot of, of discretion that the judges really have in sentencing. They can't say, you know, well, you're supposed to get 10 years, but I'm only going to give you five. Mm-hmm. Now, you can sign a, a conditional plea agreement. You can, they don't, I don't think the feds like to do that, but I have heard of it. I've heard of especially up north, people get it a lot. You know, they'll say, look, we have... We caught you with a gun. We caught you with 10 kilos. If you take a guilty plea today, we won't indict your mom. We won't indict your sister. We will let you plea to five years. We're just going to sentence you to five years. Mm. So then people are like, well, heck yeah, I'm going to do this because you know, I'm facing 20. Right. So where do I sign? Or they get you to like rat out people that are close to you. Right. And then they'll take time off your sentence for that as well. Right. So Which and is that, what Matt Cox did. What's that? Cut everybody's throat around him just to get Matt to, Cox to did? cut down his own sentence. Yeah. Oh, I I didn't hear anything about that. Oh yeah, he he he's he's open about it. He's proud of it. Really? Yeah. A lot of he gets I a lot of flack online for it though. For cutting people down. Yeah. He he uh he even he talks about how he met a guy uh, walking the yard, a guy who he became friends with, who basically told Matt where he hid a bunch of his money, and Matt immediately went to to get the money. So told, oh, told he told the somebody money says, "Hey, I I know where this guy's money is. If you cut some time off my, uh, but off Matt my, got twenty six years, right? right? He got twenty six. I think he only did twelve. Oh, that's still a long time. Yeah, that's a really long. But time. But he found people to uh, he found met people in there and found out their secrets and then told on them to get time off his own sentence in prison. In prison. Oh wow. Yeah." That's crazy. He talks about it on the podcast. He's not. He's not ashamed of it. I didn't watch the whole episode. I, I watched maybe. I mean, he's done five multiple episodes. It. It'd be hard to. Yeah. Okay. But I'll have um, to check it out. Well, I meant. Yeah, I his meant whole Max thing is the first time what a month ago. I thought he was a great stand-up guy. Yeah. Actually, we, we yeah, had he a is good a great day guy, together. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> a lot of a lot of fun together. It was a, it was a great day. We were actually on the investment joy. That was the first time you ever talked to him. The first time in person I've ever really. Talked to him. Yep. Pretty great. Did he recognize you? No, he didn't. Well, at, when I when he first saw me, he looked at me. He's like. You look familiar, but we didn't know each other. So I definitely remembered him. Mm-hmm. I mean, how can you forget Matt? Right. You so He's especially not. when you have that image of him leaning forward with his bag, like a mesh bag with his books and his everything in it, just speed walking. I mean, you have to picture there's like three buildings on the compound, yeah. A, B, and C, and they're all connected by sidewalks. And then the library is all the way on the other side of the compound. you got the rec yard over here, and then you got the library over here. And everybody's waiting by the doors, just waiting for them to pop the doors for a five-minute or ten-minute move. A one-way move. So you move on that ten minutes, and after you get where you're going, you're stuck there for the next hour. Every hour on the hour, there's a move. Mm. And the people that would go to the library, they would rush to the library. So, because so as soon as it's at capacity, they draw the line. They say, oh, got to go. you got a couple minutes. you just got to go to the rec yard for an hour. So. Yeah. Uh, he was always leading that pack, racing to the Was library. he? <laughs> always. So, I, you know, that's where I remembered him. Pretty wild. That's funny. Was he well-known in there? Did, did people ever talk about him? Or So, I didn't know him, and I didn't hear about him there, but... He said he was running some real estate classes or something. He, he did, and there was actually another guy. I, took, I didn't take his class, but I took Dave Martinelli's class, and <laughs> I'm surprised they let this guy teach this class because... He literally teaches you how to commit fraud and not get caught. Hell yeah. That's my kind of <laughs> class. Uh, it was an interesting class, and Dave was, was – he was a hoot, man. Was he? He was fun to be around, but not smart. No? Def- definitely not smart. <laughs> yeah, but, Matt, uh, Matt's pretty sharp. Um, very, very sharp guy. And have you seen his art? Oh, yeah. So I didn't even know he was an artist, but I yeah. went to his Instagram he's like, page. He's got a like, degree wow. in fine arts. Brilliant, man. Just brilliant. I can't wait to see. So on the way, when he was seeing Brandon Schlichter over at Investment Joy, mm-hmm. uh, Brandon owns like laundromats and, and a bunch of real estate throughout central Ohio. 
and has a pretty big following. He has like 2 million followers on TikTok and, and like a million or so on YouTube. So I guess he's doing a painting for Brandon, like mm-hmm. standing in front of his laundromat, and they're going to put it behind bulletproof glass on the wall. <laughs> nice. So I can't wait to see what this painting looks like. It's That's pretty, pretty cool. He's done some really cool stuff. Yeah, Matt's, Matt's, some really Matt's take – Matt's a, 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 an exceptional person. He uh, The first time he did a podcast on here, it was like he had never done any kind of interviews or anything anywhere. And he was like – he reached out to me straight from the halfway house with a few emails. Wow. And it was just a random day where I had a guest had to reschedule and I needed to do a podcast that day. And I just randomly texted him like, hey, can you come today? I mean, he's got a heck of a story. And then, and then it ended up being – having like millions of views instantly. It was insane. Wow. And now he took the opportunity and ran with it. Like he's been doing commercials. Mm-hmm. He, people are flying him all over the place, paying him to come consult with them. And he's doing a lot of cool things, selling a lot of artwork. And it all started here. Yeah. This was the first thing wow. he ever did. How about that? And he really, he took the opportunity and fucking made something of it. That's, I mean, that's so what you proud. have to do. You know, I'm happy the doors are starting to open for me as well. Yeah. You know, I think do realizing I remember I would, I would run every day. I would go out and run the track. And all I could think about, like, that was when I would decompress is working out. Mm. And all I could think about is, like, what I'm going to do. In the first, like, three years getting in shape and, and, and you know, reading a lot. I read, like, 500 books. Man. I would have never had the time to do that if I didn't go to prison. That's what I'm saying. I can't – I don't regret going to prison at all. What was it like – what was it like the day they told you? How much time did you get? 12 years? Yeah. And you did every – you did all 12. So my – no, no, I didn't. So okay, okay. I did, I did uh, just just shy of, I did around six years. Six, okay. So now, so three, four months after sentencing, I'm in prison. Um, my lawyer calls me, sets up a call, and he says, hey, listen, so the DEA toxicology report came back. You're, the substance that, the, how they sentenced you and how it's, uh, and how it really measures up is, they're saying it's 50%. They just, again, I, th- how did they come up with these numbers, man? So, like, do they have some guinea pig that they're te- that they're testing the drugs with? I, I don't understand how they come up with it, but they said fifty percent is potent as the dr- as they initially thought. So that justified a three level departure, which took almost three years off the sentence. So almost four It's like three and a half years. So that's big, a big reduction. And then when I was incarcerated, they have what's called the RDAP program, and that stands for the Residential Drug and Alcohol Abuse Treatment Program. Mm-hmm. That's a nine-month program. If you complete it in nine months, it's residential, so you move to a drug dorm. You're with other uh, people who have recognized that they have a substance abuse problem. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, chronic marijuana abuse disorder. <laughs> <laughs> so at the advice of my lawyer, I made sure that they knew that I had a marijuana abuse problem before I went to prison. Um, wow. <laughs> and it works. It, it does work. And you know what's funny? People pay these prison, these white collar guys that are like terrified to death of going to prison. They got caught stealing a couple million dollars. They go to prison. They're like, well, no, I'm going to do 10 years. This is not good. And their lawyer's like, don't worry, man. You're going to get a year off for this. You're going to get a year off for that. Don't worry, man. You're only going to do five. And they're not wrong. I mean, if, if you stay on good behavior, uh, which is not hard to do in federal prison. It's not hard to not get in trouble in federal prison. I mean, it's it's really not. So, I mean, you might get caught taking a banana out of the chow hole. They're going to make you push a pink lawnmower for an hour. You know, it's they're not going to throw you in the hole for that. Um, you know, the, it, you, you, you mind your own business, stay in your own lane, work out, read, do things that are productive. Um, a lot of great people in there. There's a lot of scumbags too, but... A lot of great people, it's not hard to mind your own business, man. It, be respectful. Be polite. Don't put your feet in other people's chairs. I, I saw a guy almost get killed for using someone's chair as a footstool. That's not smart. Think about it. You wear those shoes in the bathroom everywhere yeah. you go. But people that are coming, these white-collar guys coming straight off the street, they're not thinking like that. You were in this low security, though, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And FCI, FCI Coleman. And then I went to Pensacola Camp. So when I got to Pensacola, that's on a Navy base. That... I think, what's her name? Bar, uh, I'm trying to think of her name. She wrote an article about Pensacola like in the late 90s, how it was like club fed. Mm. Um, you, you have to Google it, Pensacola club fed. Pensacola so, club fed. That's your cue, Aiden. So, uh, you know, she wrote this article, blew it up, said these are the conditions. We had a movie theater, like a real movie theater, mm. um, gourmet food. 
b- back then, prison was not a bad experience. They even had co-ed federal prisons where men and women were together. You didn't really? wear jumpsuits or greens or khakis. You wore street clothes. Hmm. You know, it's... Uh, and even at Pensacola, they didn't have they, the movie theater was no longer active due to asbestos or whatever. But, excuse me, we did have movie night, and pretty much every night after four p.m. they play movies in the visiting room on a big screen, hmm. and you know you can pop popcorn, bring food, do whatever. Really, man, it and I hate saying this like I'm not trying to. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing that without it, you know, there's no conjugal visits. So you take the conjugals, you got to give these guys something. Yeah. So, but, you know, the camaraderie, and I made more friends at Pensacola than I probably made in my entire life. Really? And, oh, man, my buddy Mark <laughs> Frazier, um, he's over in Indian Harbor Beach. He owned, uh, like, pill mills. He, now, he refuses to call it that, but he owned multiple locations. There were pain clinics. People, they were bringing people in by the bus load. They were prescribing them. You know, to, to, they were selling Oxycontin, and the DEA came in and said, you can't do that no more. You're going to prison. And, you know, I met multiple people that were in that line of work. I think he got five years. Um, I worked out with him every day. He was my workout partner. I'm hoping to see him while I'm here in Florida. Great dude. I mean, one, one, of, the, one of the best dudes I've ever met. And so, like, I really what can't. What made him a great dude if he was selling Oxycontins to loads of people? Well, I, I know, right? So, but, but look at what I was doing. Yeah, and, and we. I I'm, think, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, right, so, what, what makes him so great? I mean, he has integrity. If he tells you he's going to do something for you, he does it. He give you the shirt off of his back. Um, he's not going to steal from you. He's not going to lie to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, what really constitutes? What really makes someone a good person? You know what I mean? Is it a, a mistake that they made, or the wrong path that they took in life, the wrong turn? You know, we, we're all capable of making mistakes, and I think most people have probably done something in their life that they could have went to jail for. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a book called like three felonies a day it talks about it, how even a federal judge is committing three felonies a day and doesn't even know it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's thousands, there's what, 200,000 laws in this country. Mm-hmm. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, if you distill all of those laws down, don't hurt people and don't take their shit. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. Right. Why do you have to pervert justice? Why do you have to confuse things? Mm-hmm. You know, why do you have to create all these thousands of laws it's well, pointless. It's, it's, Don't it's hurt people, industry. man. Don't hurt people. Yeah. And, you know, and, th- and, that, and that's where in, in the RDAP program, which I'm so gra- That's where I met Mark. In the RDAP program, I'm so grateful that I had an opportunity. Now, of course, I took this program to get a year off my sentence. Mm-hmm. That's why I took it. That's why everybody takes it. Right. But in the program, what, th- what it really does, it, it's based on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. And it c- helps us connect the dots between activating events, between something happening and the way we feel. The idea is that there's something that happens in the middle of those two things. And in the middle of those two things is our, th- our cognitions. It's our thinking. And we think in patterns. So when we develop a thinking pattern, these patterns persist. That's what patterns do. So they pull can- that thing in front of you a little bit more. You, you, My you, bad. You, if, you're, if you want to be over there, you can pull it. So, yeah. so these patterns persist and... And they wreak havoc in our lives. And the thing is, it's so easy to point a finger and be like, well, you made me feel this way, or you did this, and you did that, and, and it made me feel this way. But the thing is, is all we're doing is pushing the blame. When in reality, it's not what someone else did that made me feel the way I feel. It's what I thought about what they did mm-hmm. that made me feel the way I feel. The meaning you put to it. Right. But, but the idea is, you know, we have 70,000 cognitions a day, and most of those are irrational. Like 80% of those are totally irrational. Really? Yeah, most of our thinking is irrational. Like, right. So now we think about it. Hopefully before we get down to the feelings, the actions, and the outcome, yeah. before we act or respond, we think about it and we do the right thing. So by evaluating the way I'm thinking, by realizing that the way I feel, like when I real the, the number, we call it a, a uh, rational self-analysis, an RSA. So, you know, I write down what happened. I write down what I thought about what happened. And that might be 10 different things. And then I write down how I felt. How did I feel? It all starts, for me, the way I do it, and I still do them today, the, the way I do it is when I feel some way that I don't want to feel, when mm-hmm. I realize I'm sad or I'm angry or I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated, I'm stressed out, uh, something's not adding up, then I just have, I, sometimes I should do it more than I do, but, but you know, I write down the feeling first. And 
then I draw like a little emoji or emoticon that kind of symbolizes how I feel. And then I try to evaluate what led to me feeling that way. Because through that, it's just exercise, man. If you want your muscles to get bigger, you lift weights. If you want your brain to get sharper, if you want to think better, you evaluate your thinking, you exercise your thinking. And over time, the idea is that your thinking patterns get a little better. So Interesting. So you're kind of like back engineering the way you feel into like thoughts and, right. and, and, and things. It's that funny, the RDAP program, world. if you take it seriously, it turns you into, it turns you into like a psychologist for right. real. I, I love it. I think. Is it R-D-A-T? R-D-A-P. R-D-A-P. Residential R-D-A-P. Drug and Alcohol Abuse Treatment Program. Okay. Something like that. What is this? A Florida uh, Federal Prison Camp in Pensacola. Is this the one you were talking about? Yep. That's the camp. Now, so I'm trying to think of the, na- the lady's name. It's a well-known article. Uh-huh. She wrote an article about Club Fed. Club Fed. I think she talked about how they had swimming pools in prison, <laughs> and a lot of people, the taxpayers, didn't like that. You know, they painted that like that's yeah. a very bad thing. There's this book called Gringo, mm-hmm. and it's about this guy that was on the lam for like 10 years. He actually did time for – he hired Pfizer or one of the big – Johnson pharma- Johnson. A big pharmaceutical <laughs> company mm-hmm. to press his pills for him. Really? And – they were doing it legally, and he was. I think there were speed pills, and he was selling like millions of them. He was living in Vegas, so he talks about the camp that he went to. Mm-hmm. It was co-ed. There was women there. Of course, wow. they drew. They 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 cut that out. Yeah. Yeah. He said all these these Colombian women would show up in their Versace, and you know, it's it, it was like a it was it was crazy. But I had a I, I was talking to a female that was on the show, and she was talking about her. She went to prison for a few years, and she was saying that just the women run the prisons because all the the prison guards are males and they're most times than not they're kind of like dweeby guys you know they're not, they don't get like the big burly tough guys to run the women's <laughs> prisons <laughs> right that because makes sense. those they send them, them to the men's prisons they send like the dweeby nerdy kind of like frail prison guards to the women's prisons and it was oh. super easy for them to manipulate the guards so, like, the girls would, like, tease them, like, sexually or whatever, or, like... And they would go for it. And they would totally go for it. And they basically ran the prisons, the prison camps. Even if they did get the big burly guys, I mean, think about it. Oh, they like, still could probably do that, right? The power of... Can I say pussy? The yeah. The power of pussy. You oh, know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's crazy. I mean, human nature is human nature. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you're an inmate or not. Like, yeah. it's still there. Frank Venice actually met his wife, his first federal bid. He, she was a psychologist at the prison. Oh, really? Or a nurse, something like that. Yeah, I met her there and that's got another, married after That's another thing. People love to marry. It's a thing. People where people like to meet and marry people in prison. That Specifically, is like, killers and stuff. People who kill people. I So, after I completed RDAP at Pensacola, I did a near-home transfer. My sister had my niece, Abigail, and I didn't have a relationship with her. And I wanted to build a relationship with my family. I hadn't seen my father. Now, my mother came to see me, but my father's not big on airplanes. He's not big on traveling. Very old-fashioned. So I wanted to get closer to home. The closest prison next to Ashland, Kentucky, was Big Sandy Camp. Now, Big Sandy is a notorious USP Big Sandy is one of the most notorious federal prisons in the country. Helicopters landing all the time, people getting killed, um, multiple black hands for very large gang organizations there. Black um, hands, like the 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 shot caller, the the guy in charge, the okay. you know El Jefe, okay, um, El Chapo. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, you know, so it's a notorious prison, but they also have a satellite camp. It's just a pen and a camp. Mm-hmm. So you got a maximum security prison, and then you got a camp, a minimum security prison. Now, this prison, it's notorious in the BOP. Everyone knows about it. It's like heaven. If you, if you have to do time in the feds, you either want to go to Big Sandy Camp or you want to go to Yankton, North Dakota. That's Everyone knows that. So, and the reason is there's no fence. So you're not fenced in. Mm -hmm. There's no locked doors. There's no handcuffs. Mm -hmm. There's no guards. There's nobody policing you. You can drive vehicles. If you have community custody, you can drive in the community. They'll give you a credit card and let you go to the store and buy stuff and bring it back to the prison because you're trusted to do that. Um, I serviced 44 vehicles. I was the clerk at the auto garage. I was also the head chef during lockdowns. So during a lockdown which was almost all the time because they can't behave at the penitentiary. They're always trying to kill each other. The, they would bring the campers down there to run the kitchen. And, it, you know, it's funny. A lot of those guards there will tell you the only reason we're in prison is to help them run the prison. Uh, they, 
these guards, they acknowledge. I mean, I've heard multiple people, multiple guards tell me, like, dude, keep your head up because you're a good dude and you're a hard worker. And that's all that really matters. You know, you're going to, you're going to, unfortunately, you're going to experience some pushback. It's not going to be as easy for you as it was before, but your heart's in the right place. And that's really what matters. Honestly, it, 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 it's just wild. There wasn't, uh, there was 59 inmates at Big Sandy when I got there. That's another reason people want to go there. There's no one there. No one it's there. a ghost town. Yeah. And there wasn't one person at that facility that you couldn't trust living next to you. They're all, they're all good people. They made mistakes. They, you, you can call it a mistake. Mistakes like something you did the one. They made the wrong choices mm -hmm. for the wrong reasons. Sure. But, and some of them did. Some of them I really believe are innocent. I have some crazy stories where I believe people are innocent. Donovan Davis is one of them. I don't know how much you know about his story, but. Oh, I know. We did a whole podcast on his story. It's, and that man is, he's, that's a truly good, I mean, you're, if you ever have the opportunity to meet the guy. Yeah. He's, he's a great guy. He's a good person, a good hearted person, a good spirited person. The whole, it's just insane how something like that can happen to you just by being associated with the wrong people. How long does he have left? Do you, do you know? I don't know. Or how long he had or no? He got sentenced to 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. Okay. So, or maybe it was longer than that, actually. That's what he told everybody. But right. Matt was telling me, I think it was like 16 years. Oh, fuck. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Like how the feds can bring evidence into the courtroom <laughs> and say that like you bought this Ferrari and this Lamborghini and this Rolls Royce and this speedboat and this yacht and all of in this 15,000 square foot mansion. And you bought all of that through illicit gains when it's not true. His family owns a, a very established horizontal construction company. Um, you know, very large company. And they, ha they lost their own money in the fund. He put a million dollars of his he own. He was money. one of his the victims. Put, he was a victim. Right. And, and a lot of the victims acknowledge that they, they don't, they didn't want to see him go to prison. They came to court to testify in regard to that. But here's the thing. The feds are very good about striking any evidence that helps your case. If it helps you or paints you in a positive light, forget it. The jury's not going to hear it. If it hurts you or makes you look like a scumbag that deserves to rot in prison, they're going to hear it. So it's, it's like they stack the deck against you. And I know that sounds biased, but I've just heard it so much. If you look at how it's done, you know, they, they, they have the jury selection the voir dire, voir dire, however you pronounce it. And then they have like the, an evidence, like a preliminary evidence hearing where they get to decide what the judge gets to decide what evidence gets to make it into the courtroom and what yeah. evidence does not. Yeah. So you can't just bring what you have and let the jurors decide. Nah, you got to let them stack the deck first. And that's what happened. That's what I truly believe happened to Donovan yeah. Davis. Nah. Yeah, it's unfortunate, man. It is. He doesn't belong in prison. I can honestly say that. I believe that with every bone in my body. That man should not have done one second in prison. Were there any people in your indictment that went went to jail or went to prison with you, like co-defendants yes. or anything? Yep. How many so people? There's five or six. Okay. So uh, there, there's a few people, my employees, the people that work for me. And you know what? That's crazy, too, because even though a couple of them helped give them information about me, I can't hold it against them. They're all great people they've always been good to me they trusted me you know they trusted that I knew what I was doing that they wouldn't get in trouble they too didn't belong in prison none of they're, they're all great people mm -hmm. you know I met Natalie in church of all of all places uh you know and and what, met who in church uh Natalie Zanetti so she's one of the all she was doing was sending money so I would have fake IDs made I would give her the fake IDs. She would go and send money through Western Union and, and MoneyGram using a fake ID you could use at one time. After you use the fake ID, you got to cut it up. Don't use it again. For whatever reason, so... This is what you were doing to stash your money? No, this is how we were initially paying to order the product. I mean, you, you got you to... Gotta oh, factor. you left that out. I didn't know right. you are making fake IDs and doing all that. Oh, yeah. So really? I would have a whole stack of fake IDs. Like Holy shit. Of them. Same picture. Different real life, real information, or as real like, as possible. That's like what Matt was doing. I don't know the depth of what Matt was doing, but yeah. So you know, you gotta you gotta skirt the system. He to, was actually uh, he was scanning IDs, cut and pasting them like the Riddler, and scanning them, and and like literally by <laughs> hand creating these IDs. Like wow, brand new IDs. forgeries. Yeah, I guess that's where the art degree came in. <laughs> yeah, that's the fine arts degree. <laughs> 
Crazy. So Natalie, how she got caught was she used the same ID twice. So there's two different instances. I think she got out of that. I just lost like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. So I gave her like twenty thousand dollars cash, and I said, "All right, use a couple of different IDs and go send money over a couple of day period using Western Union and MoneyGram. You can use each ID one time at Western Union and MoneyGram. After that, cut it up. Don't use it again because when you try to use it again, it's going to throw a red flag. It's like it runs through their system and they realize that it's not real. And Explain to me why you had to use a, de- a different ID every time you sent money to China. Because every single financial transaction is logged. The Department of Homeland Security, the DEA, they have access to all of that. So if they see that Justin Smith or Natalie Zanetti is sending millions of dollars to through China. to China, they're going to have some questions, especially when I can't show on paper that I'm making that kind of money. And you're only supposed to use Western Union for what, friends and family transfers? <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, it's very, very tricky thing. So what happened was she went in the store with, I think, five grand maybe and used an ID that she had used before. They kept the ID, alerted the authorities, kept the money. And I guess they, she claimed she got away. She claimed she didn't get detained. She claimed that you know, that everything was just normal and they let her continue doing whatever she was doing. But the reality is, is she was busted and Mm she, I'm guessing she, you know, she flipped. So at that, you know, we don't want you all we, all we care about is Justin. We know he's the one putting you up to this. We know that he's the one, you know, he's the one running the operation. He's the one we want. So help us get him. You're, you're, you're okay. Right. So, and then, uh, you know, and that's how it works. They scare the small fish mm-hmm. to get to the big fish. And, you know, it, it's effective. But at the same time, like, I, I was the one that made the wrong call. I was the one that sold this to my friends, that sold yeah. this to my employees, that convinced these people to trust me. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that makes me sad, man. Like, like, looking back, that's one of my biggest regrets is the fact that I got really good people in a lot of shit. Yeah. And they didn't deserve that. But, you know, then you make the argument they're grown adults. They made their own decisions. They knew the risks, did they? I don't, you know, it's, 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 it's a tricky thing. But. So you lost all your money when you got out. You, when you got out, you had basically nothing. When they, when you finally, well, you said you did so six the, years, right? Yeah. The first cu- couple years in prison, Serpify was still making money. So Ser- oh. Serpify was this little niche. We didn't advertise it at all. It was a little niche uh, SEO product. A crowdsourced traffic exchange. We launched mm-hmm. it on a site called blackatworld.com. Mm-hmm. And we sold like a quarter of a million dollars. And it just went it went crazy. And then, you know, after a couple of years, it died off. I wasn't there to run the business. But subscriptions were still trickling yeah. in. Um, so I was making a lot. I was making decent revenue for being incarcerated for the first few years. I never had to ask anyone for money. Never had to ask anyone to put money on my books that wasn't my own money. Oh, okay. So, and I'm I'm grateful for that. You know, a lot of guys are in there. I would, man, I would listen to people on the phone calling their mom, mm-hmm. saying this guy just stole the shoes off my feet as he's wearing the shoes, lying to their own family. <laughs> just to get them to send money. And then as soon as they get the money, they go and buy someone commissary so they can get some K2 and get high. And now that's a bad person, you know, and and you you say, you know, what constitutes a a good person? That would not be, that's, how could you do that? I couldn't live with myself, man. Like, Hmm. I think like, I think what, well, if they're addicted to K2, I mean, yeah, but are you going to blame a drug or are you going to accept responsibility and accept it? Well, if you're addicted to K2, doesn't mean you're a bad person. I don't think. (laughs) <laughs> no, I think if you're making bad choices you're and in the wrong taking place advantage the wrong of people time. and hurting people around you, it makes you a bad person. But yeah. it doesn't mean that you can't recognize your error and fix it and For become sure. a good person. Yeah. You know, the way the, the conditions that you're in right now can change, but the only person that can change it is you. Mm-hmm. The only person that could change the conditions I was in was me. And I realized that. And I said, well, I better change this shit because this is not okay. Mm. You know, this is not, I'm not doing life on installments. I'm not going to prison. This is not my life. Mm -hmm. Things might be harder now, but I got to make the best of this. You know, I was 264 pounds when they weighed me in when I got to federal prison. And I lost, I got down to 200 pounds in the first year. Wow. So just working out every day. And uh, I remember I couldn't even run a quarter of a lap. (laughs) And I, I felt like I was gonna have a heart attack, and you know now I can go out and run five miles. You know how good that feels. That feels, dude. It completely saved my life. That's that, incredible. That sounds crazy, but no, a it's lot. True. Everybody says that. People who did long stints, they say the prison saved their life. It, it, it did. 
It really did. And not just that, the relationships I made, honestly, it, I've never, I've always been kind of antisocial, wasn't really good at making relationships. Mm. Prison forces you to step outside of the box. It forces you out of your comfort zone. You don't have an option. You know, if I never used to be able to use public bathrooms. I remember one time in school, I called home sick so I could go use the toilet, you know, and I, I couldn't use a public bathroom. But the, then when you fly into Oklahoma, which is usually the beginning of your bid, they fly you to Oklahoma, which is like the detention center. Then they decide where you get designated. Then you go to where you're designated from there. Pretty crazy, right? Like sentenced in Orlando, you end up in a prison an hour away from where you're sentenced, but you go to Oklahoma first. That's so, so weird. It's weird, but uh, they put you on that rickety, rusty 747 that they stole from some... Con Air. Con Air. <laughs> so, you know, it's crazy. All the overhead compartments are like... <laughs> I was like, oh, no, we're going to die. <laughs> you know, but, but uh, you know, they put you in a room where there's one toilet in the middle of the room, no dividers, and there's 100 people in there. So if you have to take a shit, you have to use that toilet. Did you ever do that? Yeah. I mean, you don't have an like? option. County jail was like that, too. You know, when I was in county jail, you, 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 have, you, ha- you can hang sheets and stuff, and then the guards yell at you and take, to take it down. Yeah. But you're taking a shower in front of everybody. You're, you're, you're going number two in front of everybody. You just, you know what? We adapt. Human beings are highly adaptable. Mm-hmm. You think you can't do something, but you can do it. You know, yeah, when you have no choice, <laughs> when you have no choice. You'll do it. What? How did that? How did that? Taking a shit in a room full of people with no barriers, dude, it's humiliating. It's dehumanizing. Doing honestly. that compared to, I mean, on the flip side, for a kid that never even liked to use public restrooms, it was what, hard. What man. was the the actual effect on you from doing that? I think it was positive. Now you know I no longer have that problem. I'm no longer pee shy. I can walk <laughs> up to a urinal and whip my dick out and take a piss. You know, I can I can use a bathroom anywhere. Even if it's dirty, I just wipe it off and lay a toilet cover down and just do what I got to do. Dude, if you got to go, you got to go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's so... Did it make you more of like, uh, like, I mean, <laughs> did it make you more of an open person in general? Definitely. Did it make you more extroverted? What? How else did it affect you? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely extroverted now. Yeah. Um, now I find myself starting conversations with people I don't even know. Yeah. Um, that wasn't me before prison. And that's a very... You know, I'm still learning. I'm still getting better at that. But that's a very beneficial thing. Like getting stuck in, in your comfort zone is probably the most dangerous thing you could do because you're closing yourself off to all kinds of potential, all kinds of opportunities. Mm-hmm. I was just at the mall a couple of weeks ago and I was waiting outside the bathroom on my girlfriend. And this guy walks up to me and just starts a conversation with me. And he's like, I like your tattoos. Where'd you get them? I said, Federal prison. <laughs> and this guy's, you know, he's dressed really nice, and I can tell he's got money. Turns out he owns a big packing company, um, has millions of dollars invested in crypto. Uh, he's doing extremely well. And now we're talking on Telegram, and, you know, it's it's just crazy. If you step outside of your comfort zone and talk to people, you're gonna. that's how you make relationships. And, you know, when I was closed off, I limited myself so much, you know, just, just so much. It, I had legitimate business ideas before I went to prison. If I had not done what was comfortable to me, you know, making money easily, taking the easy road, not considering who it was hurting or, or, you know, the negative impacts, the negative Mm -hmm. consequences that could have came from it and just did the right thing, you know, believed in myself enough to engage and talk to investors and sell my idea to the right people, Mm -hmm. then money is out there. Legal money, good money. It's yeah. out there. It's it's out there in abundance, and I'm learning that now with Contractor Plus. You know, it's money is available as long as you're doing right and as long as you can produce reports, as, as long as you're tracking your progress, you have a good accountability system for yourself and for your team, mm. and you can produce reports that show how accountable you're being and the progress that you're making. You know, it's all about the KPIs. But it, it's readily available. We've already raised 42000 of a $250,000 seed round. It's been up for less than a month. On for WeFunder. what? For what are you talking about? For Contractor Plus. What's so, Contractor Plus? So Contractor Plus is a field service management solution. Mm-hmm. for It's a mobile field service management solution for Android and for iPhone. And we have a web dashboard. It does everything from estimating to invoicing to payments to um, to job scheduling uh, it, it literally helps you if, whether you're a handyman company or a plumber or an electrician or a painter, it doesn't matter what you do. If you send invoices, if you need, if you need to show your, if you, if you want to look good to your clients and you want to win more business and grow your business as a field service company, contractor plus helps you. And it's totally free. You can go download it for Android and iPhone. It's totally free. What's funny. And I don't know if I can say this. I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but 
I started this business from a cell phone in federal prison. Wow. So a contraband cell phone. <laughs> and, of course, you're not allowed to have it. But what's funny is, you know, I got off the bus at Big Sandy. I went there because I heard there's 59 inmates and 57 of them have phones. Some of them have two. <laughs> so I think it's crazy. First of all, you even got to pick the prison you went to. Normally you wouldn't. So you tell them you want to go to Big Sandy, and then they'll send you to Ashland. I didn't want to go to Ashland. I was the captain's orderly at Pensacola. So I worked in the hallway, and every morning, I'm not saying I did get preferential treatment, I would say, because of this. I, I'm not saying normally it would work out this way because it wouldn't. But I went to my case. I did it the right way first. I went to my case manager after I completed the RDAP program. I said, look, I want to do my near home transfer, which is one of the perks of completing the program successfully. And she said, well, I'm not sending you to Big Sandy. But you actually get two picks. You get to give them two places that you want to go. And after you complete the program, they're supposed to give you one or the other. Yeah. It, usually, though, it'll be something you didn't even ask for. It's yeah. crazy. So came back. She wrote down Ashland and wrote down one other. Ashland and, and uh, Morgantown. I don't want, she's like, these are the two closest facilities to your house. That's what I'm putting you in for. Mm -hmm. She didn't give me the opportunity to pick. So I pulled up on the warden in the chow hall, and I said, excuse me. And, you know, and the captain stood forward, patted me down first before I talked to him. And I talked to him. I told him the situation. What was her name? Miss Pickerel. Miss Pickerel. And I told him what happened. I was like, look, like, Ms. I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to throw her under the bus, but, you know, I completed the program. I've done everything right. I've stayed out of trouble. I thought I could put in two things. He's like, you can. And I said, well, according to her, she's put me in for what she wants to put me in for. And I don't get the pick. He said, I'll have a word with Miss Pickerel. So then he, talk, he talks to my case manager. And the next day she calls me to her office. And she's, she's livid. She's yelling at me. I just stood there like in shock, like, wow. You know, and she's like, why did you go over my head? Why did you talk to the, she's mad that she got caught for not doing her job right. <clears throat> so I went and talked to Miss Foltz. And interesting, she was the case manager coordinator. She's like the boss of all the case managers. And, you know, I would hold her door in the morning, hold her coffee for her while she was coming in her office. I was always in there polishing the brass and cleaning the mop in the hallways and stuff. So she was already acquainted with me. And I went and talked to her. And I said, I told her the situation with, you know, how I, I told her how everything went down. And I said, is there any way you could help me to get designated to Big Sandy? She said, why do you want to go to Big Sandy? You want to get a cell phone, don't you? <laughs> it's Everybody knows. It's known for cell so, phones. And I said. It's a cell phone prison. It's known for. Cool. So, so, uh, so I said, no, I don't want to get a cell phone. You know, that's not my intention. I, I just, I heard it's a good facility. She said, it is a good facility. She said, I opened it. I, I was there for 15 years. And she said, you would probably like it there. And I told her how everything went. She went down and talked to the warden for a couple of minutes, came back, punched it in the system. Next thing I knew, designated BSY, Big Sandy, Kentucky. Wow. So made it happen. And when I got there, as soon as I got off the bus, uh, officer Smith, interesting. That's my last name. So officer Smith, he was walking me through the corridor. I just, I was waiting on a ride. I shot an inmate was picking me up to drive me up to the camp. And, uh, so he said, so if you want to get a cell phone, anything you need, just go talk to, uh, this guy named Lou, big Lou. He's the store guy. You can't miss him. Uh, big black guy with, with a beard. He's kind of short. He said, he's the store guy. So you, you just talk to him. He'll hook you up. And <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty wild, but you know, you play it off like you're not trying to get a phone, but the what staff, kind of phone, what, what kind of phone was it? So there was all kinds of phones. I mean, people, I saw everything from the latest iPhone to the cheapest Android. Um, I had, uh, it was an Android phone. It was a, like a J seven. Were they smartphones or were they yeah, like yeah, flip, smartphones. flip phones? No, okay. no, no, smartphones for sure. There were, I even saw tablets. So I, I saw everything. But, uh, you God know, we man. would we fucking would ap Apple store in there. <laughs> I hope that I'm not blowing the prison up by saying this. I'm going to have a lot of people mad at me. But uh, then don't worry. Nobody yeah. listens to this podcast. <laughs> so, except you know, actually Matt's probation officer listens to it. Oh, does he? I'm sure mine will, too. Yeah. You oh, know? you still dealing with the probation officer. I didn't yeah, even think about that. I am. So I actually I've been blessed. My probation officer is. Honestly, I don't think I could have got a better probation officer. He's been good to me. It's not I've heard horror stories, but he's been nothing but good to me. Really? He's been good to me. Of course, you know, he has to show up and drug test me and stuff like that, but you don't have he doesn't have to worry about me. And it's nice knowing that like for example, a week a couple weeks ago, he sent me a link to a program 
uh, that the that the United States Patent Office is having, where they do pro bono patents. And he was like, "This might help you in your business." You know, he's actually trying to help me, and uh, you know that 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 says a lot. Uh, do you have to pay any restitution? No, I don't. No. Oh yeah, you're lucky. Matt has to pay a lot of like millions. Yeah, when there's when it's fraud and there's like injured parties, like when people have lost money, then you have to pay it back. Wachovia, man, he stole all the money from Wachovia. It's was it Wachovia? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's before it was Wells Fargo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. I remember when that when that acquisition happened, when they changed all of the Wachovia buildings over to Wells Fargo. I don't even remember that. Yeah. I wasn't paying. How long ago was that? <sighs> Ten years at least. Yeah, I wasn't paying. It was a while ago. Back then. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. I remember Wachovia was like blue buildings, blue and gray, and then everything changed over to the the red. I heard Wells Fargo has more offices than any, like more real estate than any other bank. I, I don't know, but they that have, makes sense. They have more fucking like locations, physical locations. That's crazy. Which I don't know if that's a good thing or or a bad thing, the way the world's changing right now. You're, you're saying like leaving fiat? Like, like nobody leaving. works is working in offices anymore. Right. Everything decentralized. Everything's decentralized. Everyone's working from home like, doing stuff. I like, the, I like the new normal from that aspect. There's a lot that I don't like, <laughs> but, you know, like flying down here, uh, wearing a mask the whole time. Like I'm so over the masks, man. Yeah, same here. Like, I think like our immune system is meant to be exposed to bacteria and viruses and we're supposed to develop immunity to this yeah. stuff naturally. Just let it work the way, it, you know, and someone brought it to my attention. The guy I met at the mall, it's so crazy. His, his username, freedom fighter with some numbers on it, but so his username on telegram. So, you know, he's a freedom fighter. What's this telegram you keep talking about? Telegram's an app. Um, they have like groups so you can subscribe to a group and people post stuff, uh, in the group and it, it's not a lot of clutter. Like you'd think it's constantly blowing up your phone. It, it's not bad, but it's like, like a social media app. Kind of, you know, it, it's, it's more like sharing information. Like there's good, like altcoin and, and cryptocurrency conversations on there, like Bitcoin bin. Um, there's a bunch of stuff on there where you can get good information on, on the, the, the up and coming coins that you should be investing in, you know, new opportunities. So it's kind of like clubhouse. Clubhouse is great. It's awesome. You know, just, just li Tyler actually, um, uh, talked a lot about Clubhouse. I downloaded it a couple months ago and listened to a few chats um, that Grant Cardone is big on Clubhouse. You know, really good stuff on there. Startups yeah. raising money that talk about how to do it. I mean, the information is readily available. It's like LinkedIn, but with audio. Right, all audio. <laughs> I, I think it's a brilliant it's idea. It's just people trying to find opportunities and meet new people. Right. It's actually, it's actually really cool. I like it. Yeah. Pretty cool concept. I can't get into it. I've tried it a few times, and I just... I'll tell you what they did wrong, though. By default, the notifications on Clubhouse blows your phone up. Does it? So, oh, man. My phone was like, ding, 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 all day. I was like, where do I turn this off at? So how is, how is Telegram different from Clubhouse? Telegram is more like just direct messaging okay. and then chats. Okay. So you can get in groups where, you know, groups of information is being shared, okay. and there's really good stuff in there. I mean, as long as you subscribe to the right groups. Right. Um, so, it, I mean, I think it, I think it's useful for sure. Hmm. Okay. So we're, we're we're talking about a guy you met in the mall. Uh, yeah. So what I, you saying? He uh, something about masks or something? Oh yeah. So he, he noticed my mask said, um, "Freedom doesn't look like this." Is what my mask says. Oh. And he wasn't wearing a mask in the mall. Oh. And you know, of course, he was looking like a million bucks, so he looked like he owned the mall. But uh -huh. and maybe that's why he gets away with it. But he said, "I don't wear a mask anywhere." And I said, well, how, you know, I've tried walking in places without masks and people tell me to put it on or leave. So what do you say when that happens? He just says, it's my constitutional right. I'm not putting it on, mm -hmm. you know, and then, but I think about it and I'm like, well, wait a minute though, the private property axiom, like the, like, if, like if you own a business and Find you a say yeah. that you don't want people in there without masks, don't you have a right to do that? It's your business. Yeah, for sure. So then shouldn't people respect that? You know, people should respect if that. If they want us. Eat your, at your restaurant, right? Yeah. And if not, they could. Then I think that's the way free market capitalism really regulates itself. Is like if you don't want to go to a place that's forcing you to wear a mask, then go somewhere that doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your choice. <clears throat> so but you know, I respect private property rights on the street or driving in your own car or out in the park or whatever. Don't wear it, right? <laughs> right. If there's people around there that aren't wearing masks, and you want to wear your mask, then don't fucking go to the park. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So. You know, but th that that you're sending a very clear message with uh, having freedom doesn't look like this on your mask. <laughs> yeah, it's so, like what, it's like the people with the uh, like you know somebody who has like a Trump mask or like a MAGA mask. Oh you know, they, they don't really want to be wearing that mask. 
they're just uh they they want to they want to wear that that bumper sticker. You, you know, know, not to get political or anything, but isn't it kind of crazy? I don't think it's so things are so polarized right now. Like mm-hmm. you drive in like the rural areas and everyone still has their Trump signs up. Oh yeah, they're around here everywhere. too. Everywhere around here. Like they this is the first election I feel like people have not been able to let go of. They just can't Oh no. Can't, just let it go, man. Oh yeah. Let it go. I you talk to me? people all the time. <laughs> they just they're, they're always talking about the the fraud in the election and and voter fraud that destroyed the ballots. I've heard so much. More stuff. people are more pissed off about voter fraud this election, I think, than ever before. It's never been talked about this much as far like in, no, my, in my lifetime. election, like I remember when Trump got elected, it was a bunch of problems. They've been claiming fraud every election right, for right. a while now. It, honestly, I, I feel but like it's, it's never been theater. It's, it's never just, been. Oh, yeah. It's well, a distraction. It is. It's like the WWE. But it's never been. It's always been just like no one's been so attached to the actual person. You know, everyone's been like red or blue, but he's not a politician. He's a businessman, but but they're (laughs) so attached to him. It's like, fuck the Pollock, fuck left or right. It's Trump or die Trump or bust. You know what I mean? He's such a genius communicator and is such a genius marketer. He's really fucking embedded. himself. And he likes to grab women by the pussy. Hell yeah, he does. So Why not vote for that? Grab him by the pussy. (laughs) He, uh, he really, he knows what the fuck he's doing. That's for sure. I have to, I have to hand it to him. But but yeah, a lot of people, a lot of uh, a lot of people just can't let go of him. You know what I mean? They have that emotional connection to him. I think where I'm at with it is like I realize that it's all a bunch of BS. You know, it's it's to me like George Carlin, actually one of my favorite comedians, mm-hmm. uh, the late George Carlin. Yeah, he used to say it's all a bunch of bullshit and it's bad for you. You know, and that's what he—that's what he had to say about the government. It's totally bad for you. I just see it as as a big lie. You know, they put this puppet in office who's not really making any decisions at all, and that's really what I believe is that you know the intelligence community—it's way beyond—it's way above that. He's just mm-hmm. a puppet. It's just a marionette, and he's someone we can blame all of our problems on um, for four years or eight years, and then we just move on to the next guy. And it's funny because they they keep us divided left and right between trivial issues that should not be dividing mankind. Like, it's okay if you have a difference of opinion on something, but we should still be able to shake hands and get along. And, like, you know what I mean? Like, we Mm -hmm. should not be so divided over stuff that doesn't matter. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, it's okay that you have a different opinion than me. Like the most, fu- I mean, the hard part about it is all these fucking companies, all these news, pu- uh, news companies, and and social media platforms. Everyone who exists on social media, who makes a living on social media, the only only way for them to generate traffic and earn income is to push these hot button topics that get people riled the fuck up, like these police shootings. Pick your side. You're gonna be red or blue. Right. Here we go. Put out a fucking headline that, that and, and then that's how they earn their income. <laughs> Those headlines the just problem. grab you by the throat. Like yeah. they force you to pay attention to it. That's the problem, is that that's how a lot of people make their money online by by getting those that yeah. shit to, to go viral. You know what I mean? Getting those crazy headlines. That's what people uh, what that's what attracts people. That's what gets clicks. Use trigger words, yeah. evoke emotion, yeah. high arousal emotions. Mm. That can be good or bad, mm-hmm. but make them evoke curiosity. Make them have to understand what's behind that headline yeah, or, or question that. And they're going to click it and they're going to read. And, you know, the headline's the most important part for sure. Right. And and that combined with the actual social media platforms that are just giving you the content that you typically right. interact you put your with. Right, clickbait on the social media platforms. Right. They know what you like. The they, they track all your stuff. They track all your interests. Everything. So. Dude, it's so crazy. I was talking about my back hurting. And I swear Alexa's listening to me. Like, yeah. Because an hour later, I'm seeing ads for back pain i'm seeing ads for like a roller that i like roll back and forth mm-hmm. i was like i want to buy this wait a minute an hour ago i was talking about my back hurting yep wait a minute wait a minute did i consent to this you oh, know yeah but i did that happened and- to me i had a friend over <laughs> we were talking about we were talking about uh my wife was talking about getting a new cat this was like a month or a month ago before, <laughs> before we got our new cat the next day we're watching uh we're watching a game on TV a basketball game and there was a fucking Purina cat food commercial on TV. Yeah. So wait, are the well, television ads syndicated? Uh, yeah, I, well I have YouTube TV. Okay, got it. So it's like So of course it's all through Google. YouTube gets all like the local networks and it's just like regular TV but it's called right. YouTube TV. So my phone's hooked up to it. So my phone listens to everything. I think Google calls it AdSense. So it studies it's like yeah, a cookie yeah. that follows your browser behavior mm-hmm. but are they buying the data from Amazon as well? Like, how are they getting? I'm sure. They or have to wait, be. Google is listening as well. So you know, right. your Android's listening. I and guess Google is YouTube, right? So it's Google owns YouTube, right? right? So you know, 
it, it, when I look in, when I look at my Coinbase account, yeah, it has my trade activity, and I look at thou, so, like at one point I would send a hundred bitcoins and thousands and thousands. I go through all the history, and it just makes me sick because now Bitcoin has hit what sixty three thousand yeah. dollars. I was buying Bitcoin when it was twenty bucks. And I bought hundreds of them when it was $315 and it stayed there for a while. But instead of saving it, you know, at the time I, I couldn't see uh, into the future. I didn't, I couldn't predict that Bitcoin was going to be worth $60,000. I mean, who could? Um, so I was sending it to pay for the, the research chemicals that got me into trouble. It's so crazy because if I had just held on to those <laughs> thousands of Bitcoins, I would be a billionaire, or at least hundreds of millions of dollars. So it, it's just it's. What was you? What were you saying about this? The array, the array, array of equipment you had mining them. Oh yeah. So my friend Brandon and his brother Ben were importing containers full of uh, these 333 mega, megahertz ASIC ASIC um, Bitcoin miners. They're little USB chipsets. Back in the early days when you could literally mine coins a day from you know ten of these things, and. I ordered hundreds of them, and, and I set them up on, like, cooling pads with USB arrays. I'd put, like, 12 in an array or 10 in an array, and I could I could install USB cards in the computers where I could have, like, 20 of them going on any individual machine. So I had, like, five computers going with a bunch of these. My, I had them on metal racks, like storage racks. And if you open the room, I think I have a picture. If you open the room, you see all these little blue lights blinking. And you look at the screens and you can see I'm in these mining pools and the Bitcoin's just racking up. But what's crazy is these, by the time they would get a shipment of miners, like it started with these, these 333 megahertz miners, the, it would be, become harder to solve a block, to one block, one Bitcoin. So the benefit of pulling all of your resources together is a like hundred different people can be working to solve the block together, and then you get paid faster. If you're working on it by yourself, then you have to wait until you solve the whole block to get the coin. So we'd pull our resources into these these groups and or these pools, and so all of our computational power was going to mine the Bitcoin to to so we could get paid faster. And it's just so crazy because as Bitcoin become more and more difficult as more Bitcoin got mined, there's only what 21 million something Bitcoins yeah. that'll ever be created. Right. And it'll never go beyond that. And that's, <clears throat> that's also why the value keeps increasing as, as the volume increases as the 24 hour volume, as more people start trading and the supply stays fixed, the value will increase. How many Bitcoins was your machine mining a day? I f anywhere between five and 10, I could mine between five and in the early days, a month later, that became harder. My same computational power would, would only mine three to four. A month later, it would only mine two to three. A month later, it would mine one to two. A month later, and this was in a period of months. I mean, it, 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 it was very qu quick. The window was very quick. And you so. were using these Bitcoins that you were mining every day to, for what? For a lot to, of things. I was for, selling them. I was exchanging them. So, right. So a lot of times I would send it to China to pay for a product that... And you didn't need to create fake IDs to send Bitcoin, right? No, I didn't. That, that simplified things a lot. Yeah. For sure. But if I just held on to the Bitcoin, you know, it's... It, man. What did you do with all the Bitcoin before you got arrested? What I did with all the Bitcoin? You still had a lot of Bitcoin when you got popped, right? No, so I... Yeah, I did have some Bitcoin. I had... Uh, I didn't have a lot. Most of my Bitcoin I had sent to China. Okay. Um, I had a couple altcoins. Like I had some Dogecoin. That's gaining a lot of popularity Do Doge now. Coin. You Doge had it coin. back then? Oh, yeah. When At, was that created? Uh, 2000... Um, it was a long time ago, 2011, 2012. I don't really? know. Oh, it's been around. So, um, name coin. That's how you get like the dot onions. Um, I, it, when the Ethereum came out, uh, ETH, I bought a bunch of that Litecoin. You know, I, I bought, I dabbled with cryptocurrency a lot. You know, I'm going to see a friend in Orlando, um, hopefully while I'm here in Florida who I put on to cryptocurrency. And just last year, he made over a million dollars. This, this, it's just unbelievable. Just, and, and here's the thing. You don't need to know anything about trading. You don't need to know how to read the charts. It helps if you do, but you don't need to. All you need to do is look for the new currencies that are actually backed by decentralized DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, backed by technology that is promising. What is a DAO? So a decentralized autonomous organization, for me to put it in simple terms, I use like I use an example of an app called Around the Block. It doesn't exist, it's all hypothetical. But I, I called it Around the Block because, you know, it's 
it, it has a double meaning, you know, around it's built on the blockchain. And it's, it's also like an Uber based app where your driver's waiting to pick you up. He's just around the block. Mm. So, or he's going to take you around the block, whatever. So picture an Uber style app. The developers build this technology and they make it a totally free market. There's no back, there's no company in the background running things, pulling levers, regulating things, regulating what you're allowed to charge, marking up the prices. Uh, instead, they create, a, they create a token. They call it DriveCoin, DC. So now, in order to use this app, in order to transact in this economy, you have to purchase DriveCoin first. When you pay a driver, you're paying them in DriveCoin. You're not paying them in USD. You're not paying them in, their, in your local native currency. You're paying them in the token. It's just like when you go to an arcade. You can't put money in the machines. you got to first exchange your money for a token. And then you take those tokens and you put them in the machines. You see, cryptocurrency works the same way with DAOs, a decentralized autonomous organization. It's decentralized, means it's not centralized on any, any given server. It's, mm -hmm. all, it's, a, it's a decentralized peer to peer so network. So that's all you need to create your own altcoin. So, yeah, you can create an altcoin. There's uh, numerous ways to create an altcoin. But then, how do you add value? A lot of these, there's a lot of scams in altcoins. I'm not saying you can't make a money, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't make money with a shit coin, mm -hmm. because people do it every day. They pump shit and dump. Coin. That'd be funny. You should make one called a shit coin. Right. Well, the, people call shit coins like any. Uh, I would say like half of the new tokens, the new altcoins that come out, are shit coins. You know, people might have a good idea, but. In theory, it sounds good, but in practice, they don't know how to really build the tech behind the idea. Mm -hmm. So all they got is a white paper. <clears throat> they, they put out a white paper, they build a fancy website, and they sell you on the idea of what it could be. And a lot of times it's a scam. But a lot of times it never they're, happens. They're most of them, like Litecoin and right. Ethereum, they're all just spinoffs of Bitcoin, BTC, right? Right. I mean, Bitcoin kind of planted the seed. Right. It definitely paved the way mm -hmm. and educated people on the blockchain technology. So like back to around the block to understand that what a decentralized autonomous organization really is, is, you know, like picture the developers build this technology. They're not building a company. They're not forming a C corporation. They're not incorporating at all. It's no government recognized entity, excuse me, at all. Instead, they build this technology and they allow you as the driver or you as the rider, you as the person who uses the, the app to choose what you're willing to do and who you're willing to transact with. You as the driver get to set your own rates. You get to choose what you share. You want to share your driving history, link it with the government API. If it exists, if it doesn't, it should, um, link it with your criminal background, put post pictures of your car, post pictures of yourself, you know, share as much as you want to, or don't share anything at all. And a truly free market. People transact with the people they want to do business with based on their credibility and their believability, not based on, you know, not based on anything else, not based on who the government says you're allowed to do business with or whatever. So let the drivers, if you charge $100 a mile, of course, I'm not going to hire you to drive me from point A to point B. I'm going to go with the most economic right. option. So don't mark up the prices at all. You don't, Uber makes money by marking up the fares. They make money when, by, by charging a premium on what you're paying the drivers. Right. And they have hundreds or thousands of employees to pay in the background. For what? You, it's unnecessary. Build a technology that runs itself. Autonomous. It's fully autonomous. It's automated. So you build a technology that does what it needs to do. Let people, let everyone who participates in this choose what they're willing to share or what they're willing to do. Force them. The only way to transact inside of this technology is to first purchase a cryptocurrency that's native to your solution. Like DriveCoin is mm, to around the block. that's how you make money. As more people transact... On with a currency, as more people trade a currency that has a fixed volume, that has a fixed amount, like there will only be 20 million of these, more and more people start using it, what happens to the value? Good Demand point. increases. Right. The quantity stays the same. So that drives the price up. So now the developers hold on to, say, 10%. They hold on to 10% of these coins, these tokens, for themselves. Because they created the technology, they did the work, they turned it loose to the world. They gave it away. Now, if people see this as a viable option, if they start using this technology, if they start uh, transacting, if they say, well, you know what, Uber's more expensive because Uber's charging a premium, so we actually save money by hiring people in around the block. So if they start using ATB or around the block for, for their ride sharing and their driving instead of Uber, now... People, have, people start buying more DriveCoin. 
as people start buying DriveCoin, the value goes up, the developers get paid. They can sell off their DriveCoin and convert it to their local native currency or Bitcoin or whatever, whenever they want. But the problem with this is a lot of the developers can be scammers. So, right. So the, so the problem with shit coins or altcoins in general yeah. is it's easy to scam people. Right. You know, you sell people, you put together an, a, a nice, a pretty website, which there's thousands of templates available, mm-hmm. theme forest. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you change the logo, you put together a white paper selling the idea of what you're trying to do. And if it sounds good enough, there's enough money in crypto now where people are going, you can sucker a bunch of people How into buying stupid it. stupid is the term white paper, by the way? Like, <laughs> the fuck you couldn't call it? Try to make it sound better than it really is. Oh, it's yeah. a white, a white paper. <laughs> the fuck does that even mean information on what the product is what is it a business plan or something no i mean in a gist it's more like a product plan it's like what we what this product the problem it solves right and you know and 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 how we're going to do it okay so if it's believable people will buy it but white paper makes it sound more fancy i guess (laughs) right so and a lot of a lot of these coins that's all they have if you get in pre-sale though like like my friend ian in orlando gets in right when these ICOs, these initial coin offerings launch and become publicly available at fractions of a penny. So for five grand, you can buy a million of these things. So you buy a million coins and then they shoot up to 20 cents. You know, almost all of them are 100 xing within a couple of years. So if, you, if, you, if you're liquid enough, if you have the access to the capital to actually be able to play, you really can't go wrong because even if you buy 20 of these or say you buy 10 of these and nine of them end up tanking, all right, you put five thousand dollars into ten of these tokens. Yeah, that's fifty thousand dollars. You got a million of each of these tokens, and one of them hits a dollar. You just made a million dollars on a fifty thousand dollar investment. A million dollars. Yeah, that's good. So, is that what your friend did? How did he make a that's million all, bucks? That, that's more he put, than he a, put fit five grand into. He's so he's basically just buying new tokens, tokens that he can purchase for a fraction of a penny. Mm. Looking for tokens that are so low but are promising enough. Like, I think his criteria, he actually found a, a, a listing on Reddit that shows, like, the criteria to kind of avoid bad investments. Mm-hmm. So he's And he's also taking classes now on how to read the charts. He's getting more into trading, but it's unnecessary. That We were just talking about it the other day. It's totally unnecessary. You don't need to know how to trade. You just need to know how to set up an account, set up an account at an exchange, like Hotbit. Or, I have this wallet called Edge Wallet. Are you familiar with it? I, I haven't used it, but... Okay, I, th- I think there's 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 a slew of different wallet apps Tons. that you can use, right? And and that's the thing; it's also difficult because certain wallets will only work with certain currencies, certain exchanges will only transact with certain currencies. So you know you're pretty much forced to use like Pancake Swap or or uh, you know you, you know like ten different five different exchanges just to be able to get all access to all the tokens that you want to trade. Mm-hmm. You can't do it all in one place, unfortunately. Wow, Bitcoin's down to fifty two grand. It, the whole market as a whole has been down this week. It's been down like. 30%. I heard it because it was because of some blackouts in China or something. I, I didn't read about it, but that, that could make sense, yeah. God, it's down. You saw th- China actually announced their own cryptocurrency. They when? said, I saw that headline, like, we're equals now. <laughs> really? So When was I, this? Uh, recently, a couple weeks ago. A, a good friend of mine is telling me to buy Litecoin right now, a crypto expert that I know. He's well, saying, he keeps nagging me, did you buy Litecoin yet? Did you buy Litecoin yet? Interesting. I mean, the entry point still low enough where... It's a good it's a good long term store of value, but I think it's directly tethered to the valuation of Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin increases, Litecoin increases, and vice versa. Yeah. Um, what about OXT? Have you heard of OXT? Uh, I, I haven't. Okay. How much do you do you trade Bitcoin? So I'm not actively trading, but okay. I do buy. Okay. So so you, you buy it and sit on it. You don't yeah, buy it and I'm, sell it. So my rule of thumb is every time the currency doubles, I sell off ten percent. So if I buy in at a fraction of a penny and it doubles in value, uh, you know, I'll sell off 10% of my holdings. And every time it doubles, I'll sell off 10%. And that way I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't ever regret selling too much. So I don't get too far ahead of myself. Um, but 10%, why 10%? I'm, I'm that's missing, just my, I'm that's just my method. And sometimes okay. it's not always uh, 10%. It's, but, but I don't want to sell off more than a certain amount because as the value continues to increase, I want to catch that ride. I don't want to just sell everything. Mm-hmm. Like, look at what happened with Ripple. You know, What's XRP. Ripple? XRP. So um, they a lot, it went up to like three dollars and something a few years is. ago. Never it's a that. it's an altcoin. Okay. So and it went up to like three dollars and, and something a couple of years ago, and then it dropped all. It plummeted. Went all the way back down. Mm-hmm. Pump and dump. Went all the shot skyrocketed. Went all now it's at like a dollar seventy. So mm-hmm. it's climbing again. 
And, uh, you know, I think the new, the new floor is going to be much higher. It's going to, I think these tokens as more and more people become aware, you know, the Coinbase IPO is going to impact the, the, the crypto market as, as at large as well, as more people become aware and more, and, and it becomes easier and more accessible to trade cryptocurrencies. And as the currencies gain viability, as more and more businesses start accepting cryptocurrency, as, as more people see it as a viable option, the value is going to continue to increase. Yeah. Without a doubt. So a lot of people have Bitcoin projected over being valued at over a million dollars a coin in yeah, what, five years. Yeah, people talk about that. Yeah. In five years? Yeah, something like that. I mean, everyone has different, they run back tests and they produce different financial uh, models of what they think will happen. None of it's 100%, but one thing for, is for certain, it, it's going to continue to increase in value. So. It, I mean, and to further validate that, you've got all of these huge hedge funds and these big institutional funds that are now dumping billions of dollars into the crypto market. So they believe in it. They see, they understand how the value. What do you think about Tesla, or not Tesla, Elon Musk dumping those all that money into Bitcoin? I mean, what about it? What do you think about it? Do you have any opinion? Some people say that he's just doing it just to manipulate the price of Bitcoin so he can just like sell, it, make it go up and then sell it off. I mean, it, I don't know the, the depths of, of, of his trading strategy or what he's doing, but of course it's an economical, it's an economic decision. Mm -hmm. Like he's thinking about how he can make more money and he sees it as a viable option. He's an ex extremely smart guy. Yeah. You know, so if it, if that just further adds val validity to why you should be buying crypto. Like if, if you're making a thousand dollars a week right now, I don't know, whatever you're making in your paycheck, set aside 10%. Don't invest it into like an IRA and stuff like buy cryptocurrency, buy cryptocurrency. Don't freak out and sell when it immediately, when it doubles in value or goes up 20% or whatever, don't sell it all, hold it for a few years. You're not going to be sorry. And, and you know, I'm not a financial advisor and I can't tell you like, Legally, I can't be like, <laughs> go put all of your money into crypto, but I can tell you what I've seen over the last, you know, 10 years. Do you invest at all in, uh, in the actual stock market? Very little. So I have a few stocks, um, but I, do you I have don't, an IRA. I do not. No, nope. So you, traditional, what's investing, your balance w with uh, traditional stock market and crypto? Like what is your, what's the, like my you, traditional stock market? I have a couple thousand dollars in a Weeble account, uh -huh. um, a few thousand dollars in Robinhood. Everything else is cryptocurrency. I'm 100% in the crypto. Really? I, I, I did Forex. Me and Ian actually had a joint fund uh, in the Forex market. <laughs> and, dude, like, we had days where we would make, like, $5,000, $10,000. Then we had days where we almost lost everything. We'd hit margin calls, like, learning how to trade. and What is trusting. Forex for people who don't know? So the foreign, that was, that was foreign currency Davis's. exchange. It's just, like, when you fly into a foreign country, right when you get off, you can't use American dollars there. Well, in some countries you can, but... Typically, you got to first exchange your American dollars for their local native currency. So you would exchange it for if you go to Europe, you're going to exchange it for the euro. You know, if you if you if you go to Australia, you're going to exchange it for the Australian dollar. They have a little window that says currency exchange. You go and they have the exchange rates. So USD to mm -hmm. AUD. Yeah. So that, that's what the forex market is. So you can download like an app called like MetaTrader. You can set up a bro an account with a broker who is just swapping currency for currency, and you can trade currencies. So. When one, you're basically betting. You're saying that you believe the United States dollar is going to be stronger or weaker against currency X. Mm. And that's what the Forex market, that's what the Forex market is. You're exchanging one currency for another. Wow. Crypto works the same way, except you're exchanging one altcoin for another or one token for another. All value is subjective to a certain point, but then you have like fixed values that we decide are, are the actual value of certain things. So these tokens. So we accept whatever the whatever the brokers, whatever the whatever the exchange rates are, we accept that as the truth. Now we have holdings in different different uh, tokens. We decide, you know, this one's up 10%, this one's down 10%. We decide what we want to exchange for for what. And mm -hmm. at any given time we can send the money to a to an exchange like Coinbase and we can do a withdrawal in our local native currency. So if we want to get it back to cash, not hard to do. Right. Ten thousand dollars a day like that. So, uh, pretty, pretty impressive. I feel just, I feel so, I feel dumb and I feel just unconfident about it just because I got in, I didn't get into it until I was, until it was like $45,000 <laughs> Bitcoin. I mean, a good thing is it's and a fractional currency, so you can just buy. And I put a bunch of money in and that, then it went up to 62 or whatever. Now it's Sold down down. to 52. Right. 
I mean, you made money, right? Kind of. I'm <laughs> kind of like even. I feel like I'm just at even right now. My my, I'm not a financial advisor. My strategy would be to mimic what Ian's done. You know, look for new currencies that are viable. Mm-hmm. Look for teams that are believable. <laughs> look for teams that, you know, and I hate to say this because, you know, I don't have a degree from Harvard or Yale. And you don't have to have a degree from, you don't have to have an Ivy League college education to do something big, Mm -hmm. to do something important and to actually create value. You don't, you don't even have to have a college degree as a matter of fact. So, um, but look for teams that are believable. Look for teams that have already created tech that have done something successful because now you, now it's, it's like, um, what's the name of the coin? I don't know the coin offhand, but I sent it to Ian a couple months ago, the co-founder of, of Apple, um, Wozniak created um, a, a, a token, put his did name he? on it. Yeah, it did. I didn't even know that. A couple months ago. And I told Ian, I was like, buy this. He didn't buy it, actually. <laughs> and he came back to me, and he said, I wish I would have listened to you. He said, it went up. I said, it's all about the person behind it. The person's believable. Mm, you know, right. the person. Same, same thing as stocks. It's all mo- it's all sure. emotions. And- right. And, and that goes back to Elon Musk. You know, is he look is does he see value in what he's of course he knows he's going to make money mm-hmm. so mimic what he's doing you're going to make money yeah. too if you can find access to like what his portfolio breakdown is apply that to yours you're going to make money fuck so for sure well that was a way better ending than the first one <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad we we did that for sure cool no bro doubt. oh by the way how many uh how, how many bitcoins did you own at the at your peak Oh man, it, I mean, it, any. Let's given, figure out how 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 what your net worth would be right now. So at any given time, like the problem is, is I would have like a hundred here, a hundred there, a dozen here, a dozen there, a hundred here, and, it, and it, you know, but at any given time, I never I had just, thousands. Ju- just so, humor me for one point. But in total, yeah, probably five thousand bitcoins. You had five thousand oh, bitcoins at any given time. Yeah, I mean, in total, oh if you total God. it all up, for sure. So what's the math? 5,000 times <laughs> 55,000. I don't even want to hear this number. Don't want to hear it. 275 million. There you go. Jesus Christ, dude. Quarter of a billion. That's bonkers. You know, and I know so many people that came from nothing and now they're mm. swimming in cash, making good investments. Um, I know plenty of people that are literally crypto millionaires. I, I, I'm going to see one in Orlando. Um, but what does he do? So after he got that, after he got the million dollars, right? After he, his, his initial investment turned into a million in this certain <laughs> altcoin, right? Right. It doesn't stop. You just keep it in there or do you pull any out? Keeps exchanging one currency for another. So don't sell off everything. Take back your initial investment. When it get your initial investment back and exchange it back for your local native currency or whatever you choose to be your long term store of value, mm-hmm. whether that's Bitcoin or USD mm-hmm. or whatever, put it in something that 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 you, that's accessible, that's gonna that, that's safe to you. Mm-hmm. Leave the rest of it in the market. And now, now when you see that a current, you buy the dips. So when you see that a currency's down thirty percent. Read the news about it. Make sure you're not making a bad purchase, but more often than not, it's going to rebound. Buy the dip. Don't buy the peak. Don't buy when Bitcoin's you know sixty three thousand dollars and it's at the top of a peak and mm-hmm. you haven't seen it drop in forever. Wait. Be patient. It's going to go back down. Buy it. Wait for it to increase. And the, and and then you can keep. So if you have if you have uh, say a dozen different cryptocurrencies, you can just monitor your portfolio. They have uh, crypto bubbles, so you can look at the performance on crypto bubbles and. You can see what's down and what's up, and you can make your decisions. You can say, you can say okay, this is a good time to exchange this currency for this currency. Uh, exchange a currency that's up for a currency that's down, mm. and keep swapping. You're not going to lose. And that would be more like a day trading approach, like you're constantly right, trying to right. make trades to make money, right. and it works as well. Or you can just – your strategy can literally be, I don't want to learn how to read the charts. I don't want to learn how to, st- to study and to make calculated decisions. I just want to buy new currencies. And I want to wait, and I want to make money. And that's working for a lot of people. It's working for a lot of people. You don't have to be a smart trader. Yeah. or I mean, You just don't. So it, it's, it's wild, man. That New, interesting times. Yeah, for real. Uh, you know, a lot of people, that guy I was talking to from the mall, he said the last time we were all wearing masks was 1917, 1918. 
when they inst- uh, or implemented the Federal Reserve System. The fe- so a lot of people were against that. That was a big financial shift. And they had to distract people and keep people gagged. So a lot, a lot of people, like in the anarchist, voluntarist, um, the, a, lot of, a lot of freedom fighter mentality people truly believe that what's going on right now, there, there is what we're being told and what we're being spoon-fed, coronavirus, not saying it's not a real virus, definitely is, mm. but did it come from a bat or did it come from a laboratory, you know? And there's some shenanigans there as well. And then if you look at like Bill Gates and how he was running models on, on uh, like pandemic models for the last three years, and the most recent one was like six weeks before we found out about coronavirus here in this country, and how he's an authority figure on the topic. And then well, there's a there, there's a lot of controversy controversy over the laboratory tons. thing. Wuhan Pharmaceuticals, Wuhan, China, um, where it came out of. You you see the same billionaires are on the board at this pharmaceutical company. This is one of the laboratory. This laboratory actually messes with like bio, like stuff of this nature. The reason people like to discredit people are saying that the lab thing is a conspiracy theory. People are shitting all over that idea because Trump's the one who who originally said it. He also said you could drink bleach. Or inject bleach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, inject yeah. bleach. <laughs> yeah, but it's weird though because it's actually, but, but that is actually like a legitimate thing. I think I don't remember who it was, but it was somebody high up at the CDC originally yeah. said that the lab thing was totally viable, and it, they're actually like, investigating it. And because Trump said it, everyone in the media is trying to make it seem like it's a, uh, it's not real, and and they're trying to like discredit the the lab thing. But the lab thing is actually, it seems like it's. Man, I think a lot of smart people that I listen to are not, saying that the lab thing is is very. I legit. personally believe that nothing's a coincidence. Yeah, this isn't coincidental. It's it was created by design. Like I want to be careful. Like what but I I don't know about I don't know where to go though with the conspiracy theorists that I talk. I love right. conspiracy theories; they're fun. But I, I don't know where. So to I believe go that, I believe we're gearing up towards a global financial reset. So you know, like. Wiping the debt. I mean, think about everything else that's happened over the last year. You know, they're putting money, economic stimulus packages, putting us further in debt, like the debt doesn't matter, and depositing money in people's bank accounts. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we're walking around with our faces covered, and I don't know, but this shit's not normal. It's not okay. They say it's the new normal, but there's something very wrong with what's going on right now. And And I think that it's more than what people are being told. I, I can feel that, you know, mm-hmm. I, I definitely do. I think probably a global financial reset and a, a digital currency. If you look at uh, last year, ID 2020 in the country of Bangladesh. So they, they ran a new, um, it was like a, a pilot program and, and where they were digitizing identification, vaccination records, your digital identification. I don't know the extent of it all yet, but the idea is to get all of your, all of the information related to you in a digital form. And I believe the state of Washington, um, Bill Gates' home state, is that a coincidence? So uh, did a similar program. So I think ultimately the goal is going to be get our identification digitized, get our currency digitized. I mean, money's dirty, right? It's been everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like there's like trace elements of cocaine on every $20 bill. Yeah. So it's, it's filthy. It's full of germs, bacteria. You'll get COVID touching that dollar. So. Don't touch it. Just use your credit card. Right, right. So make it a dollar on a screen. But here's the benefit to the to the central banks, the, the bankers, is they control your spending power. If they want to turn you off, all they have to do is flip a switch or press a button. Right. Now you can't buy anything. You're valueless because your value is just a number on a screen. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a huge incentive for the powers that be not Trump, not Biden. Who are the powers that be? Well, so I mean, this is conspiracy theory, but what the what did they say? The Merovingian blood. The, there's thir- like thirteen bloodlines, and you can Google it. That supposedly own the majority of the world. You know, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, stuff like that. So and also, people believe that they're aliens or they're repti- reptiles. They believe, so David Icke kind of says that they're all lizards. You know, they're like hybrids or they're like reptiles. I just had a guy on here the other day who was talking about how the, they're they're the ones who run the run the country and they're all aliens from another dimension. They do believe that. I don't. Uh, my my conspiracy, um, cap- my conspiracy mind is limited 
way before we get to the lizard talk, but you know, I, 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 I read, uh, I did read the perception deception in prison by David Icke, and He has some really crazy, interesting, far out beliefs. I, what is it? What is the title? The perception deception, the perception deception. deception. It's like, dude, it's thicker than the Bible. It's crazy. But it was an interesting read just to see, like, how far out. Like, this dude, David Icke, I don't know if you ever heard of him. I know who he is, So yeah. he went to Peru, Peru and had this spiritual awakening. And he was, like, connected with the infinite. I'm guessing he went and did some, like, ayahuasca or something, just excluded that part. But he, was, he said he was, like, standing in the middle of a field and just, like, had this, this spiritual awakening. So now every year he visits that place. He goes to that same field and, like, tries to reconnect with, I don't know. But so... <laughs> so like the, the 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 conspiracy community would call it the Anunnaki. They would say that like yep. and, and the the spiritual community or the religious community would call it the Nephilim, the fallen angels. So, you know, you, the, they do have archaeological proof of like elongated s- skeletons. Um they've actually found these elongated skulls and you know there's different theories on how those came about but in uh, giants, you know, 7, 8, 9 feet mm-hmm. tall. So Christians would believe that it's like the fallen angels came here to to breed with right. our women and like reproduce. the The other theory is that the Anunnaki, a, a, a reptilian race, came to Earth to extract the surface gold and bred with the Neanderthals and created Homo sapiens. Hmm. So people have some pretty far out. You know how do how would I know? I, well, I have well, no idea, but. Well, there was just the news that came out on NPR just the other day about that they released evidence, or it was some. I didn't read the whole article. I just read like the top headline of it. But they basically uh, they released information about manipulating chimpanzee DNA or mixing monkey and human DNA together. Really? Embryos. They were like I fucking with that. embryos or whatever. Wow. And it's like very, very close to the the whole stoned. Or the not the Stone Age theory, the the theory that aliens came down and, and injected their DNA into, into primates, lower right. lower primates, to create us, right. to advance evolution. I don't know what to believe, but what <laughs> I do know, there's a documentary called "All Wars Are Bankers Wars," and yeah. that's really eye opening. Like it, when you when you follow the money and you realize that like there's a certain class of people that get to create the money that we're spending, they create it, mm-hmm. okay, out of thin air. Yeah, they create it. We attribute the value to it. We say, yep, we ex- we accept this as our as our medium of exchange, as mm-hmm. our method of exchange. Yeah. We now give it this value. This dollar is now worth a dollar because we say it is. We believe it is. Mm-hmm. All value is subjective, though. So, But this certain class of people gets to create that. And then they get to lend it out at interest. They get to create something that didn't exist. They get to lend it to everyone in the world and charge interest on it. And they get these people in debt. When you're in debt to someone, what are you? You're a slave. slave. You're a debt slave. You're a slave. Mm-hmm. You're enslaved. They own us. They own you. Mm. So, you know, in that much economically, I, I can't really dispute that fact. So all wars are bankers. Wars, what, that, what that aims to illustrate in like 45 minutes is that the bankers fund both sides of every conflict. They profit regardless of who wins. It isn't about who wins. And if you look at, like, how wars have, how we're waging wars now, like, we didn't wage a war on a specific enemy. We waged a war on terror. We waged a war on drugs. Drugs is the enemy. Terrorism is the enemy. But isn't war itself terrorism? You're dropping bombs on people. Yeah. That's terrorism, dude. Like, that. that's terrorism. So... We're waging a war on war? I don't know. I don't know, man. It doesn't make any sense, but when you think about it, it sure it does. It stimulates the economy. Yeah. Thousands of jobs, billions of dollars. Yeah. It's all about it's the money. It's definitely all financially driven. Everything. Everything. <clears throat> so, you know, I say those are the people creating, creating this construct that we live within and that we accept as normal. And those are the people that see Bitcoin as a threat or saw it as a threat and realized that, you know, this is threatening everything that, that we've created. It's threatening our power structure. It's decentralized autonomous organizations threaten our everything. 
if people realize that they can create tech and not build a business behind it and better the world, like turn it loose where we can't regulate it, and they can actually derive value, extract value out of that without paying taxes, without legitimizing it through registering a corporation or, or you know, hiring and, and paying all these fees and penalties and you know, everything that comes with starting a business, the barrier to entry to start a business is not easy. No. If you don't know someone with money or you don't really understand how to do the work to, like for me, it's working two jobs. It's it's burning the candle at three ends just to make ends meet and make sure my developers are paid. Right. And I'm willing to make that sacrifice because I understand that's what it's going to take. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. If I don't do that, I won't make it. And some people have that drive. Some people are willing to go the extra mile and make that happen for themselves. And kudos to them. That's great. But the thing is, is it shouldn't be that hard. If you really have the passion and, and drive and, and the right intentions and the, the idea, like in an idea of meritocracy, like it, it, if, if, if the idea is good and the execution is good, you should be successful. And I think that, you know, government just further complicates things, mm -hmm. you know, taxes and regulations and licensing. And it just, I don't know, man, it's, it's not a free market. We don't have a free market. This is not capitalism. It's a hybrid. We, what well, we have is socialism. You can call it whatever you want, but we got all these socialistic safety nets. You got, you've got, uh, and I, I know I'm stepping on some toes here, but like welfare and section eight. And, you know, this is, you're literally redistributing wealth. You're taking wealth from one category of people. And you're saying, well, we can't, we are our brother's keeper. We can't let our brother fall short. We can't let our brother starve. So we, you know, we have to make sure they're housed and clothed and fed. Why? I, I know that sounds horrible. I'm not saying me as a person, if I have the ability to help, I want to help. But should I be forced to at gunpoint? Because that's the reality. We've disassociated that reality, but that's the reality. If I choose not to pay taxes, what mm -hmm. will happen to me? Armed of the teeth, IRS agents will kick in my door just like the DEA did. Mm -hmm. They will shove guns in my face, yeah. and they will throw me in a cage. We use violence to extort our own people, and that is not okay. That is mm -hmm. barbaric. It is not okay. That is everything that is wrong with the world. Yeah, but if the country is a community, you know, if you have, if you're, if you live in a community and you want to th want your community to thrive, you have to protect everybody involved. And if you, and the idea makes sense that if if we are a country, if we are a community together, we have to help everybody. We don't want to have a country full of losers. I, well, I agree with that. So I, I agree that we sh like if I have the ability to help you, and you're and you're trying to do something meaningful, I should help you. But I can't agree with the absolute everybody, because I also believe that not everybody deserves to be helped. Some people don't even want to help themselves, mm -hmm. and if they're making poor choices, and they're not willing to do the work, they're not willing to actually put their best foot forward and pull their at least their own weight, just contribute enough. You can only take from the table what you're willing to bring to it. If you're not willing to bring anything and you're just on the take, 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 you are not deserving. Right. That is my belief. Mm -hmm. And I know some people would say, well, even if that person wants to just take and doesn't want to contribute, we should still make sure he's fed. I can't go that far. I don't believe that. Because you're taking from me. You're stealing from me. And, and I'm, I'm working 16 hours a day just so that I can get to where I want to be in life. Why should I support you too? Yeah. I think we should at least be, be able to, if we're going to have to be forced to pay taxes, we should at least be able to choose what, where, where our tax money goes to. Beautiful idea. You know, at least that would be a start. That would be a head in the right direction. Beautiful idea. And, you know, and things like voting I think, as I think, well. I personally think education is probably one of the most important things. I think even if a poor kid can't afford it, if he wants to be educated and he wants to show up and wants to do something and he has goals, then then I believe that tax should be able to pay for that. Because like I said, we don't want a country full of fucking losers. We want a country full of smart people who are going to innovate, who are going to generate money, who are going to generate jobs, who are going to provide right. opportunities for more people. We don't want fucking losers. I agree. So with educate you. everybody. I would much rather my looted tax dollars go to fund education and healthcare right. than dropping bombs on innocent totally. people. Totally. Totally. So I agree with you there. hundred percent, man. For sure. Well, cool, man. We're not going to solve all the world's problems, but... <laughs> We can at least figure out our own. <laughs> That's right.
But uh, but thanks again for doing this. What was what's the name of your uh, of the, your app again? Contractor Plus. Contra- Contractor Plus. Contractor with a plus sign, or you can just type it out. Contractor Plus. Contractor Plus dot app, and it's on both the app stores. It's totally free. So if you're a contractor, you know somebody that's a contractor, download it, man. It's free. Check it out. Cool, man. I love it. Thanks again for your time, dude. I appreciate it. Thank you.